Next day, refilling the required supplies, Blaze and his unit set off from the island. It didn't take long for them to receive orders from the headquarters. As always, it's regarding some pirates wreaking havoc on some small island. The task didn't intrigue Blaze much, but the marine under his command were happy nonetheless. From now on, they can earn merit points either by capturing the pirates or assisting other marines' units. With that, they can easily promote in ranks. The pirate crew was weak with low bounties on their head. Regis and Jado commanded the units subduing the pirates themselves. After that, they send the pirate crew to the nearest G2 branch. Two days passed. Around noon, Blaze got an unexpected call from Vice Admiral Borsalino himself which somewhat surprised him. Moshi, Moshi, is this Blaze Kun? Kizura's voice sounded from the Den Den Mushi. Yes, Borsalino-san. Blaze here. Blaze replied in a light-hearted tone. He likes Kizura's personality as he's a very laid-back, easy-going man who takes most things lightly no matter the severity of the situation. On the other side, Borsalino was perplexed for a moment because Blaze conversed in a way as if he knew him very well. A strange notion indeed since he's pretty sure that it's his first time speaking with Blaze and he hadn't even seen him before. Well, you were suddenly transferred under my command. I read your file, so I think you won't have any difficulty facing pirates in the first half of the Grand Line. Yes, you have to take care of me from now on, Borsalino-san. I heard you had a little encounter with fishman pirates, what do you think of them? Kizuru asked in a calm voice suiting this demeanor. It's just his manner of speech is slow. Their crew is notably strong that's because the sea is their turf. But in my opinion, there are two persons we need to be careful about, Fisher Tiger and Jinbi. Both of them are powerful, possessing vast combat experience and skilled in fishman karate. Oh, you seem to know quite a lot about the many. Kizura stretched his words. He he he. It's nothing. I just read a lot of books. Blaze chuckled. The world nobles are pressuring us to find the criminal who freed the slaves. It's been nearly ten months since that incident happened. But, the sun pirates are slippery in the sea. Catching them is no easy thing as they seem to know our moves beforehand. It should be the special ability of fishman, communicating with the marine beings. Pursuing them in the sea is indeed a challenging task. Blaze nodded his head. What do you think? Can you catch them since you seem to have read more books? Kizura spoke in a sarcastic tone. Blaze's face twitched hearing his words were used against him. He replied, I will try. Okay then, from now onwards your unit will be in charge of pursuing the sun pirates. I don't care about others, but it would be better if you catch Fisher Tiger alive. Okay Blaze replied, while the communication ended with a kaka sound. Just an hour later, his unit received a report from the headquarters intelligence department about the sun pirates location. They were spotted near Leaf Bite, an uninhabited island spread with strange leaf plants that can attack anyone who intrudes upon their territory. It was located near Red Line. It verified his conjecture, sun pirates mostly roam near the Fishman Island location. After getting an eternal log posed to leaf bite from a nearby marine branch, his unit set off. Here I come, fishman pirates. When Blaze first encountered them at the fishman district, he wasn't their match. But now, his strength had been multiplied to an astonishing degree. With his current strength, even if it's Jinbi and Fisher Tiger he has the confidence to beat them. Blaze then checked his status panel. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 34.7. Devil Fruit Potential, 32.2. Haki, none. Items in storage, none. Free attribute point, 4.0. Satisfied with the attribute points, he smiled. He's keeping the four free attribute points as they may come in handy when needed most. After having a satisfying breakfast, Blaze started his training on the front deck of the ship while Regis and Jado watched over the ship's course. Half a day passed. Blaze and his unit reached Leaf Bite but there's no trace of fishman pirates. They already left the island but Blaze had his doubts. Did they left knowing marines are coming? Blaze mused while the marine soldiers under his searched the island in and out. Captain Blaze, there's no hint of them even being here. Could the intelligence be wrong? Regis came over and reported. After pondering for a moment, Blaze replied, No, the information we got from the headquarters can't be wrong. I think they left after resting here for some time. What should we do? We can't chase them blindly, unknown which direction they went. Blaze replied, Report it to the intelligence department. We will leave after their response. Far away from Leaf Bite, the Sun Pirate's ship's snapper head could be seen cruising the sea. A blue-skinned fishman suddenly leaped from the sea and landed on the ship facing Fisher Tiger and Jinbi while other fishmen like Arlong, Aladeen also came over. What happened? A fishman inquired. It's the Marines. If we stayed there for another hour, we might have encountered them. The blue-skinned fishmen replied. How did the marines find our whereabouts when we don't even visit the human-inhabited towns? Kurubi of Arlong Pirates commented. Don't underestimate marines' intelligence and world government's power. Everything is possible for them. Jinbi stated. Did you see who was in command of the marine ship that came to leave fight? Fisher Tiger asked with his arms folded. Yes, Boss T.I. It's the same human we encountered at the fishman district six months back. The ship he commanded is a standard one among the marines. I don't think his rank is high, probably captain or commodore. The blue-skinned fishman replied. Him. Fisher Tiger frowned. As for Arlong, he gnashed his teeth in anger. How could he forget the human who crushed him? It was the biggest humiliation of his life. From that day onward, he couldn't even face the people of Fishman District. He wants to kill him, but is it possible? Boss T.I. Jinbi called. Jinbi, that human is formidable. I believe in our strength but if possible it's better to avoid him than head-on confrontation. Fisher Tiger said. Jinbi was reluctant but he acknowledged with Fisher Tiger's words. Boss, why do we have to fear a human? Arlong bellowed. We should kill him to make a good example. Arlong. Tiger raised his voice, shutting ladder. Arlong grunted and left the place in disapproval. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. 15 days passed. 
Blaze's unit and Fishman pirates were playing the game of cat and mouse. Every time, he will miss them by few minutes to an hour. Even he was frustrated by repeated failures. Though he was strong, he could neither catch nor reach them in time. How ironic? He just needs one right opportunity. A side of their ship is enough for him to get them. Furthermore, catching Fishman pirates yield him more merit points because of what Fisher Tiger did at Mary GOSA. Blaze wants to badly learn Hacky, for that, he needs at least 2,000 merit points. For now, he only has 800-something under his name. With 2,000 merit points he can once again go back to the training camp to learn Hacky from Instructor Zephyr. In Marine, he's the best teacher of Hacky. Old Man Magnus whom he met during his hunting mission gave his word that he will teach Hacky but the crux is he already told him that he wasn't ready yet. When he will be ready, Blaze doesn't know. That's why he decided it's best to learn Hacky from Zephyr. Only by learning Hacky, he can travel to the new world, a sea filled with full of wonders, great pirates, interesting people, peculiar islands, and powerful creatures. Blaze stood on the front deck of the ship to welcome a new day as golden sun slowly rises above the horizon. Basking in the morning sunlight, he felt refreshed. Golden tiny particles invisible to naked eyes gathered around him, his body shone in golden light. A sense of comfort washed over him. Morning light is the best time for Blaze to improve his constitution attribute and a perfect time to train his body. Regis and Jado stood a few steps away from Blaze, watching the latter basking in the sunlight. I don't know why Captain always bask in the sunlight, does staying under the sun bring any benefit that we don't know? Jado wondered aloud. Who knows? But I believe Blaze Captain won't do anything meaningless. Regis stated. Both of them are with Blaze for six months, and they knew about his character to a certain extent. In fact, most of the Marines on the ship were grateful to be placed under Blaze as they all developed in some way. They respect and trust Blaze very much and will follow his command unconditionally, without any questions raised. At that moment, a Marine ran towards Regis and reported, Lieutenant Commander Regis, we got another intelligence of Sun Pirates whereabout. What? Jotto exclaimed, a little agitated. Where? Regis asked. The intelligence department from headquarters doesn't know whether it's true or not as it was a tip-off from a merchant ship. They spotted the snapper head in the middle of the sea and it was sailing east. I looked in the map, and if I am not wrong, they are navigating towards Jerong Island. The marine ensign replied. Good. Both Jotto and Regis exclaimed. Regis said, Jotto, notify the soldiers and ready the sail. I will inform Captain. Blaze snaps out of his training hearing someone's call. Turning around, he glanced at Regis and inquired, What is it, Regis? Captain, Snapper Head was spotted near Jerong Island, Regis replied. Jerong Island. Blaze muttered, he has some impression of it. To capture the Sun Pirates, he studied most of the islands located near the Red Line. They mostly roam around this region. Knowing them will just help him a little, as the Grand Line is huge. At most, they can react instantly and pursue them before they disappear again. What about the things that I asked to prepare, is it completed? Blaze asked after thinking for a moment. Captain, you know we don't have any skilled persons in our ship. With limited materials, resources, and the design you gave, we had done our best. Don't worry about it. Blaze waved his hand. We just need them in working condition for a few minutes. Then you can take a look at yourself, Captain. Blaze and Regis walked towards the ship's back where Blaze saw a huge nozzle that's attached to a turbine designed by him. The turbine was then directly connected to a paddle wheel that was half submerged in the water. The mechanism is similar to Ace's striker raft but bigger. Blaze could see the engine is somewhat built crudely with low-level materials obtained from the pirate's ship destroyed by them. It can only be utilized once, then it will lose its effectiveness. Anyway, Blaze is pleased with this thing as he now has a trump card to pursue sun pirates. With this, we may have a chance to get them, Blaze muttered and commanded Regis to sail the ship towards Jerong Island. It took them three hours to reach the vicinity of Jerong Island but there was no sight of sun pirates. The marine soldiers on the ship scrutinized the surroundings to locate Snapper Head but they failed to see any. Did we miss them again? Blaze frowned. He didn't like the feeling of being led around by the nose. At that moment, his unit received an emergency signal prompting ship's Den Den Mushy to cry aloud. Captain Blaze, we are receiving an SOS signal. It's possibly from another marine unit somewhere near us. A marine ensign under his command ran forward, carrying the Den Den Mushy. Clank. Blaze attended the call without much thought and spoke, who is it? Ugh, we are from Unit G2, save us. We were surrounded and attacked by a group of fishmen. Please, her arc. The communication ended after a weapon slashing sound. It's them. Tap the signal and find the other party's location. Since it's an emergency signal, they should be nearby. Yes. The marine ensign acknowledged and ran back to the cabin. Within two minutes he found the location, it's towards their west. Under Blaze's command, the ship picked up speed and sailed forward. After 10 minutes of course towards the west direction, they spotted two ships in the distance, Snapper Head and a standard marine ship. Finally, Blaze smirked while the marine officers under his command prepared the cannons for battle. Snapper Head. Boss T.I., another marine ship appeared. A fishman holding a telescope in his hand screamed. His scream altered the fishman and all of them gazed at the distant marine ship sailing towards them. Fuck, the marines are endless. We just took out one, another one appears. They keep on coming. Another fishman commented. Boss T.I., what should we do? Jinbi asked without a tinge of panic on his face. Fisher Tiger grabbed the telescope and viewed the marine ship. He saw a familiar face, Blaze, standing on the ship's deck staring at them while his marine coat flutters by the sea breeze. What's the need to ask Brother Jinbi? We should destroy them as we did the one before. Arlong spoke in an arrogant tone, waving his kerbaki. Smack. As soon as he said those words, Fisher Tiger knocked him in the head and tossed the telescope to Arlong. Take a look. Without bothering about Arlong, Tiger commanded the fishman. Gather the others and ready the sail, we are leaving. Jinbi, call them, I don't think we can lose them that easily. Yes, Boss Jinbi acknowledged. 
As for Arlong, as soon as he saw Blaze through the telescope, his hand quivered while hatred flashed past his eyes. Even so, he can only endure it. In no time, the fishman pirates gathered and the sails of Snapperhead were opened. The ship steered little to the right and quickly picked speed moving in the direction of the wind. As soon as their ship left, the rear Admiral Catter's unit let out a sigh of relief. They were overwhelmed by the strength of sun pirates and crushed before they knew it. It's the marine ship. I think they picked the SOS signal sent by us. A marine officer spoke while groaning in pain. Which unit is it? Tell them to hurry and save us. Rear Admiral Catter with his half-beaten, bloody face cried. Damn the sun pirates, I am not letting them off. Blaze saw sun pirates ship sailing against the wind and getting away. No, you guys aren't going anywhere today. After his command, his ship also steered to the right. The wind pressure from the opposite direction pushed their ship's crushing speed to another few knots. His ship reached near Catter's, but it showed no signs of stopping. The act dumbfounded Kedar and the officers under him, they aren't here to save us. Their ship was destroyed beyond repair, their hulls were damaged with the seawater seeping inside the ship. In another hour or two, it will sink entirely. They only have two lifeboats which cannot accommodate all the marine officers. When Catter saw Blaze's ship sailing without a stop, he was enraged. You idiots, where are you going? Save us first. Can't you see our ship is sinking? Hearing them, Blaze didn't stop the ship but leaped high and walked towards them by stepping on air. You are Rear Admiral Catter, right? Blaze asked. Yes. As a marine, you should be ashamed. Your entire unit was crushed by a pirate crew and now, you are crying for help. You are also obstructing another marine unit from doing its job. Do you know what sort of crime it is? Blaze talked in a serious tone gazing at all the marine officers. No Catter didn't expect to be lectured by a low-ranking marine officer. He panicked when Blaze mentioned the word crime. I don't have time to waste on you all. Be good and stay here. Once I capture the sun pirates, I will get you all when I return. Saying this, Blaze returned to his ship. As for Catter and his unit, they were shocked, realizing they were left to float in the middle of the sea. The distance between sun pirates and Blaze's unit wasn't reducing. In fact, the snapper head seems to be cruising at greater speed. Blaze knew the reason for this, Jinbi. He's a gifted helmsman with a vast knowledge of sea currents and wind directions. With his Jeppo level, Blaze can walk on air and engage them himself. Just when he decided to confront them by himself, Snapper Head's cruising speed increased. What? Blaze and the marine officers on the deck were shocked. Only then Blaze noticed the school of whale sharks, pushing Snapper Head forward. It's Jinbi again. Jinbi has a unique ability to communicate with fish, even over long distances. The ability to speak with fish is usually unique to merfolks, but Jinbi is also capable of that. During the breakout of Impel Down, he did the same thing. The whale sharks can understand and obey his orders. Having no choice, Blaze strode towards the nozzle fixed at the back of the ship. All of you grab onto something. Saying this, he flared his right fist in flames. Blaze captain is doing it. Jotto watched Blaze powering the nozzle with star-filled eyes. Yes. All the marines on the ship grabbed onto something while keenly watching Blaze's every action. Though Blaze gave the design, they made the entire thing possible by working day and night. They want to see with their eyes what it does. Flames burst out from his hand, engulfing the nozzle. It powered the turbine which in turn spun at great speed wheeling the paddle wheel. Blaze controlled the intensity and temperature of the fire to a bare minimum so that the flames won't ruin the entire thing before it fulfills its purpose. In the distance, the sun pirates were shocked by the sudden acceleration of the marine ship. How are they doing it? What? Even Jinbi and Fisher Tiger were startled. They could see, little by little the marine ship is closing the distance between them. In a few minutes, they will catch up. Ready the cannons. Blaze shouted while the marines under his command rushed here and there loading the cannonballs. When their ship reached the shooting range, Blaze commanded, fire. Bang, 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 bang. The cannons fired at Sun Pirate's ship but with Jinbi's exceptional helmsman skills they were able to evade the shots. But suddenly the fire-powered engine let out a cracking sound and soon shattered to pieces. It was completely wasted. Blaze cursed? Can't it persist for another minute? The ship's momentum diminished a little but it still cruised forward with residual force and wind currents. Blaze knew it's time for him to make a move by himself, otherwise, he will lose Sun Pirates for good. Leaping high in the air, he raised his right arm up in the air. Flames surged and gathered towards the palm of his hand. In no time, a gigantic fireball materialized in his hand. It looked like a miniature sun, golden and glowing with terrifying heat. The fireball's appearance is similar to Ace's ultimate technique Great Flame Commandment, Flame Emperor. The only difference is the raging temperature, it burns fiercely and was extremely destructive than Ace's fire ability. What's more, it's not the end. The flame spiraling around the fireball began to amass more heat. The gigantic fireball didn't increase or decrease in size, but they were compressed to the point of explosion. The glowing sun-looking ball affected the surroundings and even boiled the sea below him. The marines on the ship some distance away also began to feel the heat. So this is the captain's true strength, the full extent of his devil fruit ability. Regis spoke, staring at the gigantic fireball wide-eyed. What's Captain Blaze doing? That thing looks like it's going to explode. Jotto gulped. The sun pirates too gazed at the second sun that appeared out of nowhere in panic and fear-filled eyes. Even Tiger and Jinbi were dumbstruck by Blaze's display of power. It's not something a human can do. Arlong along with his pirates watched the mystical phenomenon in absolute horror. Now he knew, what kind of existence he tried to fight with his measly strength. Laughable? Jinbi quickly urged the school of whale sharks to get them out of here but they were already doing their best and nearly exhausted. The sun pirates felt extreme danger from that thing, if that fireball struck them then they are done for. Some even thought of jumping into the sea and flee, but Blaze didn't do as sun pirates expected by throwing the miniature towards them. He cast the gigantic fireball towards the sky and chased after it. Once it reached a certain height, Blaze punched the fireball towards the direction sun pirates were fleeing. Upon impact, it let out a thunderous noise. Sun Festival. 
Blaze named his new attack. Bang. The miniature sun exploded. It burst into fifty-some fiery and colorful fireballs of varying shapes and streaked towards Snapper Head. Twice the size of a football, the fireballs overspread the sky and illuminated the whole region similar to a firecracker bursting into smaller ones. All of them burned fiercely and looked threatening. They rained down upon the sun pirates, unmerciful, determined to incinerate all of them to ashes. The fire shower scared all the fishmen on board out of their wits, while sheer terror gripped their hearts. As for the marines, they also thought Blaze would throw the huge fireball at the sun pirates but his actions awestruck them to the core. All of them stared at Blaze's back in awe and respect. Our captain is so powerful. Even Regis and Giotto were stunned. They marveled at the apocalyptic display of glowing balls raining on the sun pirates. They knew from the very start that Blaze is strong but not to this extent. It completely transcends the level of reasoning and changed their worldview. Of course, it's because they hadn't seen the true power of the world. If they had, they wouldn't be this shocked. Bang, bang, bang. The falling fireballs finally reached the ground and began to strike around the sun pirates' ship. What none of them expected is, the fireballs exploded upon contact. Boom, boom, boom. The impact created a firestorm and sent a scorching heat wave. The flames blazed through, obliterating everything in their way leaving nothing behind. With Jinbi's exceptional skills, he was able to evade some but not all. The fireball destroyed their sails, some struck the school of whale sharks that were pushing the ship. The whale sharks scurried away in fear, leaving the snapper head to float alone. Without their help, the sun pirate's ship lost momentum and become an immovable target. Tiger was able to block the fireball rain with his fishman karate but he too was soon overwhelmed by the destructive power of the strikes once they explode. Everyone, onto the sea. Under Tiger's command, all the fishmen came back to their senses and jumped into the sea. Sea is their turf, they aren't without any tricks up in their sleeves. Jinbi too came to his aid and jumped into the sea. All the fishmen let out a fierce battle cry and shouted giving their all, Carry you Iponsoi, it's fishman jujitsu that heaves the water current upward. The water erupts from the sea as a towering stream of water and blocked the fireballs from further damaging their ship. Since it's a combined technique used by all the fishmen, there were multiple water streams. The streams successfully blocked off the fireballs. Even so, the impact blast and heat shockwave were able to injure them to some extent by scorching their skins. Soon, the sun festival ended but there was nothing but silence. The sea itself burned in some areas and blows white mist due to extreme heat. The fishmen jumped back onto the ship, gasping in exhaustion. To stop the fireballs from destroying their ship, they went all out exhibiting their complete strength. They all looked at Blaze's figure hovering midair in horror. They knew how strong this human is since they had seen and experienced it personally. A single fireball is enough to burn them crisp. Thankfully, they were surrounded by water and were able to use their fishman jiu-jitsu to stop the attacks with little injuries. They didn't expect to encounter such a powerful human, especially Arlong. He was horrified by Blaze's power but he was smart enough to not express it in his face. Otherwise, he will lose his face in front of his underlings. Blaze looked at their reaction in satisfaction and nodded his head. The attack had left a deep impact on their heart as he expected. How is it? Did you guys enjoy the festival, or want to see another one? Blaze appeared directly above the Sun Pirate's ship and asked. There was a tiny smile on his face showcasing his arrogance and confidence. In fact, the fishmen were intimidated by Blaze's presence and terrifying strength. Fisher Tiger, I am here to capture you, if you surrender by yourself, I will let your companions go. If not, we will go by the hard way and I am telling you, it won't be pleasant. Blaze spoke in a nonchalant tone with his arms folded. The fishmen were enraged by the words but they knew they are powerless against someone like Blaze. Aside from clenching their fists in anger, they can do nothing. Blaze gazed at Tiger, waiting for his reply. Fisher Tiger was still the same he saw in the series, wearing a striped shirt revealing his muscular chest and his cruise tattoo. A captain's coat hung from his shoulders like a cape, which depicts the cruise Jolly Roger on the back. Standing around 17 feet in height with broad shoulders and a muscular physique, he looked rather intimidating and unapproachable but not to Blaze. Fisher Tiger stared back at Blaze with an expressionless and unwavering face. There's no need for words, his answer is clear. So be it. Blaze sighed while flames erupted like a raging inferno whirling around. Though he's strong, Fisher Tiger isn't also someone weak. In his younger days, he was able to command the Fishman district with his strength and beat Jinbi who already had a black belt in Fishman Karate as a kid. If he's not wrong, the Tiger of now is stronger than Jinbi. Furthermore, they are on the sea, a natural advantage of every Fishman. In the series, he was defeated by Rear Admiral Strawberry only because they have ambush and they were on land. Even so, he was able to hold the Marines till the Sun Pirates appeared. He could have lived if agreed to a blood transfusion but he refused to do to it being human blood. If the Fishman decides to escape by diving into the sea, Blaze can do nothing but watch them flee. He doesn't care about others, his only target is Tiger and Jinbi, the strongest of the group. Stomping the air with his right foot, Blaze flashed towards Tiger while the flames surging around him concentrated on his fist forming a spherical bubble. It's similar to Whitebeard's ability but in Blaze's case, the bubble is boiling flames as if his fist was shrouded by a miniature sun. Just before he could reach Tiger, another figure came forward and confronted him. It's none other than Jinbi. If you want to take our boss, you should get past me. Come on then, I hope you don't disappoint me. Saying this, Blaze punched. The miniature sun-like bubble in his hand burst out a torrent of flames that stormed towards Jinbi. The flame was crimson, ferocious, and hot capable of destroying everything. Seeing the attack, Jinbi's expression turned grim. Without wasting any time, he concentrated his strength upon his fist and punched. Arabesque tile true punch. His punch forced the water vapor in the air to release a powerful shock wave. Boom. Both the forces collided in midair generating a deafening noise. Jinbi's punch failed to extinguish the flame but was able to burst open the flames. Swoosh. Before Jinbi could react, Blaze appeared behind him and slammed the sun bubble into his back. 
The strike scorched his back to flesh level and slammed him into the sea. Jinbi. Boss Jinbi. None of them expected Jinbi to be defeated by a single hit, not even Blaze. He thought Jinbi would dodge the strike and put up a decent fight. Certainly, Jinbi of now can't be compared to his future self. Even so, he's still a formidable foe having an extraordinary physique and mighty strength. Then the only difference is Blaze, he got strong. It should be because of my constitution attributes explosive growth. I can't wait to experience what happens when it breaks past the 50 bar limit. Grinning Blaze gazed at the spot Jinbi dropped. Some of the fishmen dropped onto the sea to check upon Jinbi. But before they could get to the spot, a huge whirlpool arose and Jinbi emerged from the eye of it. It's brother Jinbi. Thank God nothing happened to him. The sun pirates were relieved to see Jinbi being alright. Mustering up the whirlpool with his webbed hands, Jinbi launched it towards Blaze. The whirlpool turned into an enormous piercing cyclone of water before streaking towards Blaze. Smiling a little, Blaze inhaled a little and breathed. A huge firestorm blasted from his mouth, confronting Jinbi's spear wave. Boom. The collision triggered a shock wave. The spear wave turned into water vapor while Blaze's flames doused after stopping the attack. Good. I hope you have more tricks up your sleeve because I am just getting started. Blaze expressed and hoisted his right hand up. The human is going to do something again? What should we do? A fishman said. Jinbi, get out of there. The flames gathered around Blaze's index finger and soon turned into a giant fireball resembling a miniature sun. Yes, this is similar to Escanor's ability, Cruel Sun. But Blaze's Cruel Sun won't be as effective as Escanor's since his devil fruit powers hadn't fully developed yet. Even so, it isn't something Jinbi can block with his current strength. Everyone once again gets to witness Blaze's overwhelming power. What is his ability? He can even summon a sun? How are we supposed to fight a being like him? The fishmen despaired, experiencing searing heat from the mini sun. Even the ones lingering in the sea felt the change in the surrounding. Arlong was also among the fishmen, he gazed at the miniature sun in terror. He masked his presence completely so that Blaze won't notice him. As for Blaze's unit, they halted the ship some distance away from Snapperhead and watched the confrontation. Traveling any further isn't good for the standard marine ship. I can keep this going on for an entire day, you know? Surrender or perish? The decision is yours. Blaze narrowed his eyes. He doesn't want to kill them, he just wants to capture Tiger since he doesn't want the latter to get killed. Right now, Impel Down is the safe place for him, but will Tiger surrender? The answer is no. He's the type of person who would rather die than surrender. The same goes for Jinbi. Some distance away, Rear Admiral Catter and his unit had a shocked look on their faces. Though they didn't know exactly what's happening, they saw a huge sun-like ball and how it exploded into smaller ones. Especially, Catter, he was terrified. He knew it should be the result of a clash between the earlier Marine unit and Sun Pirates. That young Marine comes from headquarters? Who is he? Why I haven't heard of him before. He knew very well that only Marines from headquarters possess such astounding strength. When he comes back, I should be more polite to him. Back to the battle. Fisher Tiger looked at Blazes with his never-changing expression. But in his heart, he knew the Sun Pirates aren't his match. Six months back, he had the confidence to beat Blaze but now he wasn't sure. How did the human get this strong in the short span of six months? Though he isn't certain of defeating Blaze, he won't go down without a fight. He also doesn't plan on getting captured again. On the other hand, Blaze knew he had to resort to a hard way to subdue the Sun Pirates. Facing stubborn characters like Jinbi and Fisher Tiger, he has no other choice. If they don't surrender, I will beat them till they are knocked senseless. Blaze thought and projected the miniature sun towards Jinbi. Zzzzzz. Facing the attack that already began to burn their skins, all the fishmen in the proximity other than Jinbi and Tiger fled far away. Jinbi, still in the water, conjured another whirlpool with his fishman jiu-jitsu but under extreme heat. The water in the surroundings turned into vapors. This is completely different from the little fireballs they stopped. Jinbi thought, what is that human's ability? His flames are many times stronger than normal fire. As the target of the attack, his skin began to char while the sea around him turned to beat red and boiled in extreme heat. Having no choice, Jinbi dived deep into the sea and decides to confront it from there. Jinbi waved both arms at great speed and uses the surrounding water to quell the gigantic fireball. As soon as the water comes in contact with the fire, it evaporated. Even so, it was able to reduce the temperature of the fireball to some extent. But, the miniature sun still burns fiercely, enough to incinerate him. This move is highly effective against fire as it utilizes the humidity around him but Blaze's flame isn't your ordinary fire. Jinbi was in a desperate situation powerless to stop the strike as none of his attacks to seems to work. In fact, he can effortlessly avoid the attack if he flees as he's in the sea. But he won't do that because behind him is Fisher Tiger and their ship Snapperhead. Jinbi isn't the kind of man who runs away in this situation. At the last moment, Tiger came to his aid and looked at him. There's no need for words, Jinbi understood what the latter wants him to do. Both of them dived into the sea and heaves the water current upward. Towering water streams erupted from the sea surface and confronted Blaze's miniature sun. There were nearly 50 water streams, 25 stopped the gigantic fireball from falling upon them while another 25 struck from different directions. Soon, the entire region was shrouded by dense water vapors blocking others from seeing what's happening inside. What happened? Did they succeed in blocking the attack? A fishman asked in nervousness. I hope nothing happens to them. A lady clenched his fist. Blaze waved his hand and a strong wind swept the region where his miniature sun had fallen. He quickly noticed the figure of Jinbi and Tiger. They succeeded in blocking the cruel sun. Blaze slightly narrowed his eyes. Jinbi had already lost his consciousness exhausting everything he had with scorch wounds all over his body. As for Fisher Tiger, he had burnt wounds on the upper part of his body while blood trickled from the corner of his lips. Without a doubt, he's slightly stronger than Jinbi and was able to resist the attack. Impressive. Blaze mentally commented. He thought the attack would take them both out but Tiger was able to withstand it. I think he will put up a good fight if I restrain from using my devil fruit powers. 
Well, I too need to test the strength of my constitution. Blaze mused and decided to confront Tiger head on with his fists. I hope you don't disappoint me, Fisher Tiger. Swish. Sorrow. Blaze's figure blurred and in the next second, he appeared before Tiger and lanced a sweeping head kick with his entire strength. Boom. Tiger parried the attack with his left arm and punched with his right. The 17 feet tall, broad-physiqued fishman's punch is stronger than Blaze expected. Instead of evading Tiger's punch, Blaze blocked with his left. He wants to test the difference and the result, he was shoved back a few meters. A bruise appeared on Blaze's left hand and it hurt. What a powerful physique. Good, this is what I was expecting. On the other hand, Tiger was once again astonished by Blaze's strength. He thought the latter is strong because of his overbearing devil fruit ability but he didn't expect him to be skilled at physical traits too. What bugs him is, why Blaze stopped using his devil fruit. On the other hand, Blaze once again dashed towards Tiger and kicked him but this time he used the Rokushiki skill, Rankyaku. It produced a sharp compressed air blade from his leg and made its way towards Tiger. His Rankyaku isn't very strong without utilizing his devil fruit powers. Even so, it would at least give Tiger some trouble. But what happened next stunned Blaze. Fisher Tiger narrowed his eyes and he simply repelled the attack with his fist clenched and slapped it away. Aside from a skin-deep wound, the wind blade didn't inflict much damage. Blaze understood. In terms of physical capability, both he and Tiger are almost equal. It's hard to guess who would come out as a victor. But this is what Blaze wants. He wants to push his limits and it can only be achieved by fighting someone stronger or of equal strength. Getting thrilled, Blaze confronted Tiger again. Aside from his physical strength and Rokushiki, he refrained from using his devil fruit. Tiger also noticed this. A thought came to his mind, is he using me as a sparring partner? The battle between them intensified and kept on going for half an hour. Tiger was physically strong with rich battle experience and skilled in fishman karate. They were evenly matched when it came to raw power but Blaze is better than him in terms of durability. His Senju constitution provided him tremendous stamina and resilience. Tiger finally reached his limit after fighting for an hour. Slowly, Blaze's attack began to connect and was able to inflict injuries on him. Even so, Tiger insisted on fighting with his injured and exhausted body. It's like he won't stop unless he's dead. He is indirectly telling Blaze that he can only be captured dead. Blaze was impressed. He knew fighting anymore is meaningless. He only fought like this to improve his combat experience and got what he wants. Tiger, stop resisting and surrender. You won't be able to defeat me. It's the end. Blaze spoke but Tiger responded with his fist. Sighing, Blaze effortlessly dodged the attack and warned, Tiger, if you insist on doing this, I have to knock you out. Tiger stopped his attacks and heaved, barely holding himself with just his willpower. It's my loss? I won't complain as I was defeated fair and square. But I can't let myself captured alive, again. I had enough of being a prisoner and slave. My wanted poster says dead or alive, right? You can hand me to the marines but before that kill me. Blaze gazed at Tiger whose heart resolved to die then get captured. His initial plan was to send him to impel down. Once Jinbi gets the position of warlord of the sea, he can free Tiger. But, will everything go as he thinks? Will Marine send Tiger to impel down or will they hand him over to Celestial Dragons to quench their anger? Blaze contemplated. He wants to save Tiger but the latter isn't in a position to accept it. Maybe some things are better as they are, trying to change them will result in worst consequences. Tiger continued, I can tell, you don't discriminate against us and trying to capture me with nothing but goodwill, but for me, it's better to die than to be a prisoner. Blaze thought for a moment and decided. He doesn't plan on capturing Tiger anymore. His way of thinking is too simple while the working of the world is complex. Even if you want to help someone, it doesn't mean others will accept it. Fisher Tiger, even if I don't capture you today other marine units will still come looking for you. We will meet again if you are alive by then. Waving his hands, Blaze turned around and simply walked away leaving Tiger in a bewildered state. What did he mean by that? He isn't going to capture me anymore. Tiger thought. But why? No one answered his question, it will forever remain a mystery. If nothing goes wrong, in another year or so Fisher Tiger will meet Cola and lose his life under Strawberry's hand. Getting back to the ship, Blaze commanded his unit to turn around. He called Regis and spoke, report to the headquarters that Sun Pirates escaped our pursuit by diving into the water, abandoning their ship. As a Devil Fruit user, I can't possibly chase them underwater, right? Yes, Captain Blaze. Regis's lips twitched while he kept his expression straight. He saw with his eyes how Blaze beat the Fishman Pirates black and blue while the latter had no resistance against his overwhelming strength. But now, he says he fails to capture them. Who would believe it? He doesn't know why Blaze didn't apprehend them and he won't question his decision. Not just him, all the Marines under Blaze's command also thought the same. For them, it's just a few merit points they will earn it later. Don't forget to pick the rear Admiral Catter's unit on our way back. Saying this, Blaze went to his cabin to rest. On the other side, the Fishmen were perplexed by the sudden change in event. They all thought Tiger would be captured by the young Marine but the latter simply walked away. Snapping out of their stupor, they rushed towards Fisher Tiger while some went to check on unconscious Jinbi. They felt relieving noticing his injuries aren't life-threatening. Boss T.I. Soon, both Tiger and Jinbi were carried to the already half-destroyed Snapper Head. None of them know what to do at this moment. They were crushed by a single human, it was a hard blow to them. At that moment, a Ladine spoke, first let's get out of here. We will discuss once Tiger and Jinbi recover. The others nodded while some jumped into the water to push the ship as their sails were completely damaged. Once Blaze got to his cabin, he checked the taskbar as he got notification from the system when he defeated Fisher Tiger. Defeat Sun Pirates. Reward, 1.0 Constitution plus 1.0 Devil Fruit Potential. Seeing the reward, Blaze was a little surprised when he saw there's no free attribute point this time. What happened? The Sun Pirates reward is a lot higher than Demon Bear Pirates but it still didn't yield him any free points. It means the rewards he receives get smaller as he gets stronger. 
Whatever. Blaze then checked his status panel. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 35.7. Devil Fruit Potential, 33.2. Haki, none. Items in storage, none. Free attribute point, 4.0. Equals equals. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.e.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Next day, Borsalino called him to inquire about the turn of events, what transpired and how the fishman escaped. Blaze wasn't a fool, with Marine's intelligence Kizero may very well know what happened yesterday. As an apathetic person, Borsalino just didn't care what Blaze do. It's also what Blaze wants. The current timeline is 1510 and few days had passed in the 10th month. Nearly one and half years passed since he came to this world. Many things had changed, he became strong while his attributes were gradually increasing. There should be a big change once his attributes break past the 50 bar limit. Considering his current speed of improvement, it will take time. Of course, he can raise his attributes faster by completing tasks, achievements, or defeating a strong pirate crew but his chances of meeting a powerful crew in the first half of Grand Line is pretty low. Another 10 days passed by, his days were rather relaxed and peaceful, training, sleeping and eating. In these 10 days, he didn't get to meet any pirate crew with a bounty exceeding 100 million berries. Only some small fries. So, every day Blaze would complete his training task and pass his time by practicing his Rokushiki skills. Especially, Tekai. When mastered to perfection, one can even exchange blows against Haki users. Tekai is based on the user's physical power while Haki is spiritual energy. Both are capable of both offense and defense. A good example is future Shizo. He can power up his punches with Tekai. He was able to overwhelm post-time skip Luffy's Busashoko Haki enhanced gear second form. Blaze has an advantage in this regard. If he masters Tekai to perfection, combined with his Senju constitution he can without a doubt fight Haki users. Since he won't be able to learn Haki anytime soon, it's the perfect time for him to practice Tekai. It's just mastering Tekai is harder than other Rokushiki skills. He has been training in Tekai for months but he was nowhere near perfection. His forte is Jeppo and Soro, he mastered them rather quickly. In these 10 days, they weren't any obvious improvement in his attributes. It only rose by around 0.4 points. Though his attributes didn't increase, he gained few merit points by capturing the small fries. He has around 900 merit points but it's of little use to him. To learn Haki, he needs 2000 merit points. Of course, there are other ways for him to learn Haki aside from merit points. For example, every year headquarters pick a few outstanding marines with good combat strength and send them to learn Haki. The other way is, let your superior teach you Haki. Yes, he can request Vice Admiral Borsalino but Blaze wasn't interested in learning from him. The peaceful days continue for a long. An order came from the headquarters, requesting them to assist a marine unit to catch some criminals. Blaze didn't think much and commanded his unit to sail towards the direction given to them. It was a long travel, as they had to travel to the red line where the first half of the grand line starts. What Blaze didn't know is, this journey is going to change his future. They reached the location the next day morning. The name of the island they reached is called Silk Bay, a large island inhabited by exporters of various kinds. The island is famous among merchants as many come here to exchange goods. At the same time, it's also where pirates visit frequently. Thankfully, there's a marine base here to keep the pirates in check. Next, they need to wait for further orders. As for the details, he didn't receive any aside from the fact it's overseen by Rear Admiral Anigamo. Blaze knitted his brows when he found the one leading the operation is Anigamo. He knew very well he's a believer of absolute justice and under the command of Vice Admiral Sakazuki. If he had known it sooner, he would have rejected the request with some random excuse. Since he accepted it, he can't back away now. It didn't take long for them to receive an order from above. The call was simple, they need to hold if any merchant ship comes in their direction. Captain Blaze, what is Rear Admiral Anigamo thinking calling us this far just to stop a ship? Jado complained while Regis stood next to him without any word. Let's wait and see. Blaze simply waved his hand and spoke. He stood on the deck gazing at the far-stretching sea. He doesn't know why, a bad feeling rose in his heart. It didn't take long before he spotted a standard merchant ship that tries to flee north while being followed by a marine ship. Under Blaze's command, his ship went to obstruct their escape path. Besieged by two marine ships, the merchant ship lost all its way to escape. In no time, another marine ship appeared from the distance. Rear Admiral Anigamo stood on the ship's deck gazing in Blaze's direction. Seeing his actions, Blaze's eyes narrowed. Why do I have the feeling that he's targeting me? Interesting. Under Anigamo's orders, the marine officers raided the ship and conducted a shipwide search. Blaze just waited in the ship like Anigamo and watched everything by a telescope. Soon, some ordinary looking civilians were dragged to the deck and stripped. Blaze then suddenly noticed a hoof mark on a person's back. Not just one, most of the people on the ship had a hoof mark on their bodies. Seeing this, his expression changed. Anigamo. Equals equals. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.e.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Anigamo. Blaze clenched his fist. Provocation, a naked and deliberate provocation against him. Without a doubt, his unit was requested to be here by Anigamo but only now Blaze understood his intention. As an officer under Sakazuki, he definitely knows he has a soft spot for slaves. Still, he requested Blaze for this simple operation which can be accomplished by a few marine soldiers. There's no need for him to be here. Anigamo did it on purpose. Anigamo glanced over, his expression carried a hint of sarcasm. As Blaze gasped, he did it with a bad intention in his mind. He's a believer in absolute justice and he wants everything to be through. So he doesn't like Blaze's way of doing things and what he did. He got wind of some information recently, regarding the escape of sun pirates. Though Blaze had the strength to catch them, he let them go. 
and, he was present at the headquarters when the conflict between him and Vice Admiral Sakazuki happened. That's what annoyed him greatly. Anigamo has great respect and admiration for Sakazuki, who's a next-in-line admiral candidate. If nothing goes wrong, he will become an admiral in a year or two. But what happened that day considerably damaged Sakazuki's reputation. As a firm believer of absolute justice and supporter of Sakazuki, he can't overlook this matter. He wanted to teach Blaze a lesson. Soon, he collected the information about him and planned this thing. His plan is simple, incite Blaze's emotions and make him attack. Once Blaze strikes against him, he can show him hell and he has countless ways to make that happen with his rear admiral position. Trying to bring me down with mere parlor tricks. Blaze guessed what Anigamo was thinking since it comes to this point, he doesn't need to hold back. He's the one who came out of his way to trouble him. Whatever happens next can't be blamed on him. You two stay here and look after others. Keep this in mind, whatever happens next you guys aren't allowed to come and support me. Understand. Blaze looked at Regis and Jado. Captain Blaze, what do you plan on doing? A bad premonition struck Regis. Without replying, Blaze jumped in the air and flew towards the merchant ship. In the merchant ship, 50-some civilians with hoof marks were apprehended by the marine soldiers. Landing before the escaped world Nobel slaves, Blaze stopped the marine soldiers who were apprehending the people. What are you all doing? Blaze nonchalantly asked. A marine officer recognized his rank by his clothing and replied, Sir, we are arresting the escaped criminals. Blaze nodded his head and asked, Where are the criminals? The marine officer was stumped for words while he thought in his head, Aren't they right before us? Where? Blaze asked again in a vehement tone. The marine officer couldn't voice his words, frightened by Blaze's cold stare. Captain, I am just following the orders. Captain Blaze, why are you interfering in the operation of arresting the criminals? Anigamo arrived before him and asked smoking a cigarette. Like in the original series, Anigamo is a tall man with a cold face and semi-closed eyes. He had long brown hair and wore an ancient war helmet with a small, traditional Japanese dragon on it, and a long red plume hanging from it. Under his marine coat, he wore a double-breasted gray suit over a dark green shirt with a silver tie. I don't care what you do but if you don't give me a reason for trying to arrest these innocent people, I will hit you. Blaze gazed at Anigamo. His words stupefied marine soldiers on board, Anigamo, and world noble slaves alike. The slaves couldn't find the reason why a marine is opposing another one for them. Isn't marines and the world government are on the same side? They all thought. Can't you see the hoof mark on their bodies, they are criminals wanted by the world government. A marine captain under Anigamo's command scowled. But the next second, he was blasted off the ship by Blaze's kick and dropped on the sea. I'm asking what kind of crime they committed. Blaze stared at Anigamo as if he's going to hit him next. The marine on board didn't know what to do when facing two superior ranking officers fighting each other. They simply remained silent and watched. As for the slaves, they looked at Blaze gratefully. They know this marine young man is here to support them, it stirred their hearts. Did you know what you just did? You attacked a fellow marine officer which is punishable by the marine's code of justice. Anigamo calmly talked, as for the marine captain he didn't even look. In the Anise lobby arc, when a soldier questioned his order of destroying a fellow buster called ship Anigamo shoot him in cold blood. This is the type of person he is. A kind Blaze dislikes the most. If you surrender now and accept your crime before Anigamo could finish his sentence, a fist hit his face. Anigamo couldn't even react before he was punched squarely on the face. I was punched in the face, but how? Rising to his feet with a bloodied nose, he looked at Blaze in shock. How did he hit me? Even my observation Haki failed to sense his attack. He's strong. Yes, Anigamo recently learned Haki. Though he's only been practicing it for three months, he can easily crush someone who doesn't know how to use Haki. He thought he can effortlessly subdue Blaze with his strength but he was greatly mistaken. When did he become so strong? Of course, Blaze wasn't this strong six months back but now, he is. Even if he doesn't know Haki, he can make up for it with his heat sense and Tekai. It won't be effective against skillful Haki users but against inexperienced Anigamo, it's more than enough. Blaze didn't wait, he attacked again. This time Anigamo was prepared, he utilized his observation Haki to the max and predicted Blaze's next move. But Blaze's sorrow was faster, Anigamo sensed his attack, and before he could dodge, a fist hit his face once again. I am going to hit you till you give me the proper reason, so you better prepare a valid one. The surrounding marines watched the confrontation with their mouths wide open. They couldn't believe their eyes, Rear Admiral Anigamo was getting beaten by a marine two rank lower than him. On the other side, Regis and Jado watched the dispute between two marines through the telescope. Regis muttered, Captain really punched him. Regis, what should we do? Attacking a fellow marine is a crime and Captain Blaze even hit a superior ranking officer. Our unit is done for. Jado tensely paced in the deck. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Punched again and again Anigamo lost his cool. His face had a dent, broken nose, and dripped with blood. He lost whatever dignity he had in him before his subordinates. With a resounding roar, his body transformed into a spider. Three pairs of spider-like black arms extended from his hair, as well as a spider-like abdomen. He wielded eight sabers and faced Blaze. Coating his arms with Haki, he attacked. Not to implicate the marines and ordinary civilians on board, Blaze leaped high in the air and distanced himself from the ship while Anigamo madly rushed at him. Facing Anigamo, Blaze didn't hold back his strength. Flames flared around his hand, concentrating them on his fist, he punched. A dense column of raging fire burst from his fist and blazed forward. The sudden attack shocked Anigamo as he felt immense crisis from them. The intensity of Blaze's flame exceeded his expectation, if I don't dodge, I will be burned to crisp. Hastily, Anigamo covered his entire body with Haki and used Soro to get away from the attack. But what he didn't expect is, the fire fist changed direction in midair and targeted him. The flame is the extension of Blaze's fist, so of course, he can control and change its direction however he wants. 
Before Anigamo could dodge again, the flaming fist struck and engulfed him completely. No, he screamed, feeling the scoring temperature and power behind the fist. Thankfully, he covered himself in haki otherwise, he would have been incinerated to ashes. Even so, the attack burned his skin and charred his flesh while the impact smashed him straight into the ocean. With such a measly level of strength, you want to take me down? Blaze grunted. Returning back to the ship, Blaze freed the world noble slaves. As for the remaining marines they didn't dare to intervene in his actions. Soon, the marine unit withdrew from the merchant ship and left the area saving Anigamo who was already unconscious and half dead. Blaze then looked at the slaves. There were all kinds of people, young, old, men, women. Among them are even some around 10 years old, the same age as Koala. Is it their crime for being a slave? Who defines this? Blaze thought. What made him angry is, as a marine, they have to protect these innocent people but instead, they were helping the world government to capture them back. Where is justice in it? Fu asterisk K, why am I even thinking of this since I already know the answer? The situation will only change when the marines break away from the world government grasp. Blaze shook his head. He also knew the marines aren't strong enough to oppose the world government. Only when he becomes stronger than anyone else, he can make it happen. All of you can go. Saying this, Blaze decided to leave their ship but two men stopped him. Wait, Mr. Marine, we are grateful for your help but can you do us one more favor? Asked the man around his forties. Holding a long saber in his hand, he looked nothing like a slave but the hoof mark in his arms said otherwise. The other man seemed to be in his thirties with burly built. The saber-wielding man knew the marine before he is different from the ones he encountered previously. Maybe he can help us. What is it? Blaze raised his eyebrows and asked. It's been months since we escaped from that hell but since then we were hunted like stray dogs and branded as criminals. We don't know whom should we ask for help. We just don't want to go back to that place again. The man broke out in tears and continued. I know we were asking much but can you send us home, please? I want to see my wife and child again. It's been five years since I last them. If you think it's too much trouble, at least take us to the South Blue. Hearing his request Blaze sighed and shook his head. I very much want to help you but it will only bring more trouble. I already attacked my superior officer and someone will come looking for me. The longer I stay beside you, the longer your lives are in danger. There was a disappointment on the man's face but he quickly covered it and responded. I understand. I spoke without thinking through. You already took a big risk by helping us. Thank you. Blaze waved his hand. Rejecting their request he felt a little bad, so he asked. Aside from sending you home, you can ask me something else I will try my best to help. The man thought for a moment and said, We are going towards the South Blue but we have five people whose home is situated in Alabasta. We can't make this trip as it may lead to more people pursuing us. If you can send them there, we will be grateful. Sure. Blaze accepted the request. Sending five people to Alabasta won't be a problem for him. It's just a one-day trip. Blaze said brought the five people two kids, two women, and one young man to his ship after sending off the merchant ship. As soon as he came, he was greeted by Regis and Jado. Captain Blaze. Jado stuttered, not knowing what to say. He didn't bother with them. Pointing at the five people, they will stay for a night, bring them to an empty room. Regis, change our course to the Alabasta Kingdom. Captain, you already attacked the higher ranking officer, if you do this I don't know. Regis hesitated. Don't worry, it's morning now, we can reach Alabasta by night if we rush. Before headquarters knows about this, we would have already left. Blaze assured them. At that moment, an ensign ran towards him carrying a denden mushy and said, Captain Blaze, it's for you from headquarters. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. At that moment, an ensign ran towards him carrying a denden mushy and said, Captain Blaze, it's for you from headquarters. How did they get the news so soon, not even 15 minutes past, right? Blaze was puzzled over the call. Shaking his head, he received the den mushy mushy from the ensign and attended the call. Sengoku's piercing came from the other side. You brat, what had you done, can't you think before you act? I told you already I won't protect you if such things happen again. Sengoku-san what are you being angry for? I didn't do anything. Blaze feigned ignorance, unknown Sengoku already knew what happened here. Not just Sengoku, most of the high-ranking marine officers know what happened. Wahaha, Sengoku, why are you scolding him? He did well. What's the point of being a marine if we can't even protect innocent people? Garp's voice came from the distance. Shut up, Garp. Get the hell out of my office. Shooing Garp off, Sengoku continued. Stop your act, Blaze. Someone recorded the fight between you and Anigamo and sent it to the headquarters. What? Blaze was shocked and thought, no wonder. Oh, oh I'm in trouble now. What Blaze didn't know is, Anigamo wants to record his action of punishing Blaze but in turn recorded himself getting beaten. Well, in a way, it worked against Blaze. Because of the recording, Blaze is in trouble. Knowing his misdeeds are exposed, Blaze spoke the truth. Sengoku-san, I didn't do anything wrong. He's the one who went out of his way to trouble me. Sengoku sighed. Infighting is common among the marines with opposing views, that's not the problem. But stopping an officer from capturing the criminals branded by world government is a crime? The only good thing is world government doesn't know of this yet, but once they come to know, you will be in deep trouble. You already provoked them once, they won't let you off the second time. What should I do, Sengoku-san? Blaze asked. Bring the slaves back. But they are innocent, they haven't committed any crime. What did they do to deserve being treated like this? Blaze responded and couldn't help but get furious. Sengoku doesn't have the answer to his simple question. As a marine, you just had to follow the orders. Are you going to or not? I can't. Blaze was firm on his decision. If he does that, it's the same as betraying himself. Okay then. I won't help you on this matter. Sengoku rubbed his temples in exasperation. At that moment, Garp's voice came. Don't worry brat, I am with you on this. 
Well, so that you know, Sakazuki's coming for you. He already left the headquarters, you trampled on his dignity by thrashing his subordinate. He won't go easy on you as it's the second time. Don't die brat. Saying this, Garp ended the communication. Catcha. Blaze's face twitched as he could tell from Garp's voice he's enjoying this way too much. Opposite to him, Regis and Jado were sweating heavily listening to the conversation between Blaze and the higher UPS. It's way beyond their level. In fact, their whole body is shaking hearing Sakazuki's coming after them. Regis hesitantly spoke, Captain, what are we going to do? Nothing, let's get to Alabasta before he catches up. Whatever happens, I want those five to reach their home. I promised the others that I will send them safely to their homes. You don't want me to go back on my words, right? Blaze asked. For the first time, Regis and Jado sensed Blaze is serious. They responded in a sober tone. Yes, sir. Good. Blaze knew he's weaker than Sakazuki. With his present strength, fighting against him is nothing but suicide. It doesn't mean he's afraid. If the situation demands it, he will fight even if it means death that's the type of person Blaze is. But he's not planning on fighting him. As soon as he drops those five people in Alabasta, he will be free without any worries. Then, he can escape from Sakazuki's pursuit and doesn't need to fight him head-on. Sakazuki is a vice-admiral carrying an important position, he can't waste days pursuing him. After one or two days of furious chasing, he will leave. He needs to be extra careful in that time frame. Once he crosses this period, there won't be any trouble from Sakazuki. But it won't be easy, he knew Sakazuki very well. He may seem like an angry guy with a stern face but he's an extremist who's also cunning and highly manipulative. If he let his guard before him, he won't survive much longer. Knowing the predicament he is in, Blaze pondered for a moment and opened his status panel. The only thing that can save him at the critical moment is his personal strength. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 36.1. Devil Fruit Potential, 33.4. Haki, none. Items in storage, none. Free attribute point, 4.0. He has a 4 free attribute points. He can increase his constitution attribute to 40 for better strength while increasing his devil fruit potential won't change anything major. Even so, he's not in a hurry. After all, he can raise them anytime he wants. Saving it for the critical moment is for the best. Depressing mood surrounded the entire unit, as most of them know the type of trouble their unit is in. They believe Blaze, even so, they still couldn't calm down. In truth, Sakazuki's fame across the marines can't be said in words. He's the most feared one among the marines and at the same time respected because of his strength and fearsome reputation. The ship coursed the sea towards Alabasta. Blaze stood on the deck, gazing at the far-stretching sea while deep in thoughts. If only I can learn Haki without anyone's guidance. But Blaze knew it's impossible. Haki is related to one spiritual energy which can only be developed slowly. It's not something that can be learned overnight. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Evening. It's an unlucky day for Blaze. Just after few hours of sailing, their ship met a huge storm and was forced to steer away from the original course. Thanks to that, their journey to Alabasta is going to be delayed by another few hours. Considering the situation, it seems like the clash between him and Sakazuki is inevitable. Few hours is more than enough for Sakazuki's ship to shorten the distance between them. Unlike their standard ship, the latter's ship is battle class 1. Is it predestined? Blaze thought. Blaze is confident in his strength. He doesn't have to fear Sakazuki's magma ability but when it comes to Haki he's helpless. Though Sakazuki may not be as strong as he was seen in the original timeline, he's undeniably a formidable opponent to face. Headquarters. Sengoku rubbed his temples in frustration ending his call. He knew Blaze did nothing wrong, but it's a problem when he fails to listen to orders. Are you really not going to do anything? Garp asked, sitting opposite Sengoku. What can I do? I already told him, he's on his own. Sengoku uttered. Sakazuki won't hesitate to kill Blaze. Both of them are persons with extreme opposite views and unyielding personalities. They won't stop until one of them dies. Blaze will die if we don't do anything. I am planning on sending Kuzan to the rescue. Garp spoke in a rather serious tone. If you send him what will Blaze learn? Only when he realizes his mistakes, he will understand his wrongs. Furthermore, he needs to understand that he's not above everyone else. And if he doesn't change that attitude, he won't survive even if we look after him. Sengoku spoke his inner thoughts. Even though Blaze's actions always enrage Sengoku, he knew Blaze is strong with great potential to become an admiral in the future so he won't let him die that easily. Garp nodded his head, understanding Sengoku's words. I will tell Kuzan to save him only at the crucial moment. Both of them are veterans with countless years of experience, they knew Blaze's personality and what needs to be done to correct them. Garp was like Blaze when he first joined the Marines so he understands his actions better than anyone. Soon, Garp called Kuzan and explained the situation. The problem is Kuzan is a new world, it will take time for him to reach Alabasta. Aside from Kuzan, the only person who can stop Sakazuki is Kizuro but he's also not in the headquarters right now. The current admirals can stop him but all of them are old-timers aside from Sengoku and they won't go out of their way to save a kid. Let's hope Kuzan reaches in time. Dash. Around evening, Blaze could be seen training in the ship's deck. There wasn't any sort of nervousness or fear in his demeanor, unlike the other marine soldiers in his unit. He understands their distress. Even so, worrying won't get them anywhere. Their only choice is to face the difficulty head-on and prevail. At that moment, two small silhouettes sneakily entered the deck where he was training. Blaze perceived them with heat sense, they are none other than the two kids who were among the five ordinary people. They were dressed in plain clothes and looked scrawny for their age. Both their appearance were a little similar, if Blaze is not wrong they are twins. What are you two doing here? Blaze asked, turning around. His sudden turn stunned them and fear apparent on their faces. Brave one among the two came forward while the timid one hid behind the other. Mr. Marine, we want to thank you for sending us home. 
The brave one unexpectedly thanked in a sweet voice. Laughing a little, Blaze spoke, no need. As a marine, it's my duty to protect the common people like you all. Squatting down, he asked them, what's your name? I am Ari and this is my little brother Sia. The brave one named Ari cutely responded. Oh Blaze was surprised a little recognizing the brave one is a girl while the timid one is her brother. Though they were world noble slaves they haven't lost their innocence yet. If his guess isn't wrong, they were only slaves for a short period of time before they escaped. So Blaze asked them, when did you two get captured, and how? Ari thought for a moment before replying, we don't know. We just went out to play but suddenly we lost consciousness and when we opened our eyes we were before countless people prying eyes. It was scary. After that, we were forced to do things that I and my little brother doesn't like. But if we don't do as told, they will beat us badly. Speaking up to this point, Ari broke into tears. Blaze sighed and took her hands into his own. Don't worry. You are safe now. Whatever the circumstances, you have to be strong and courageous. Wiping away her tears, Ari spoke, yes, I won't cry. My father also said the same thing when I was little. What's your father and mother doing? Will they be at home when you reach there? Blaze asked with a curious expression. I don't know about father, as he often goes out and comes back only after a few months gap. But we have a beautiful mother who takes care of us. It's been years since I last her, I am sure she will miss us badly. Of course. Which mother won't miss their little ones? Blaze laughingly replied. Don't know why, he finds the two kids adorable. Do you remember where's your home at? Yes. We stayed in a beautiful town named Nanohana, I have a lot of friends there. Nanohana. Blaze knew very well about this port town. It is the principal entrance to Alabasta, making it a popular target for pirate attacks. No wonder, these two were captured by the slave traders. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Petraon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Around nightfall, Blaze and his unit reached the proximity of Alabasta Kingdom. But, a huge crisis followed them. Don't know when Sakazuki's ship caught upon them. If not for the storm, they may have dropped the five world noble slaves and escaped from Sakazuki's pursuit. But now, even if they want to they can't outrun Sakazuki's battleship. They are cornered with no escape route. Sakazuki stood on the ship deck, smoking a cigar while his marine coat fluttered by the sea breeze. Wearing a standard marine cap, having a grim disposition he resembled a typical villain. Staring at Blaze, he commanded the soldiers on his ship. Fire. Without any objections, the marines began to fire at Blaze's ship. Without bothering, Blaze called Regis and Jotto. Regis, you are responsible for sending Ari and Sia to their home. Nothing should happen to them? Can I trust you on this? Blaze stared at Regis and asked. I will safely send them to their home, even if it means I lose my job as a marine. Regis gave Blaze a military salute. He'd been following Blaze for more than six months, he knew what kind of person his captain is. He respects him for his beliefs and courage. Like for now, even when facing someone of higher ranking and strength, he didn't flinch. That's how a marine should be, firmly sticking to their belief. For the first time, the feeling of justice arose in his heart. He also began to understand the type of justice Blaze believes in. Jotto, you are responsible for the other three. Do you have any opinion? Blaze asked. No, Jotto replied. In truth, he wants to reject Blaze's request but he wasn't that brave. Blaze inwardly shook his head as he could sense Jotto's reluctance. He wasn't as firm as Regis, it's also why Blaze entrusted Ari and Sia to Regis. But other than Jotto and Regis, he can't trust other soldiers on this ship as they aren't strong enough. He glanced at Ari and Sia. He made a promise to send them home safely, but in this situation, he can only entrust them to Regis. Mr. Marine. Ari called, gazing at Blaze. The tense atmosphere scared them a little. Don't worry. He will take you both home, safely. Blaze ruffled her hair and turned around. Walking towards the ship's back, he said. I will distract them. Captain Blaze, I hope you emerge as a victor. Regis shouted, clenching his fist. Go. Blaze waved his hand. Sakazuki's ship began to fire the cannon but none of them hit his ship as they are out of range. They wanted to deter his unit and win without a fight. Any marine unit would be frightened facing the pressure of a battle-class ship and vice-admiral rank officer. It's also why Blaze decided to face them, alone. He didn't want to implicate the soldiers in his unit as he knew Sakazuki is the type of person who won't show any compassion and will be heartless even if they are marines. During the summit war, Akaina killed any marines who contradict his beliefs, as he even executed a soldier for leaving his post in fear. If not for Shanks, Kobe would have also lost his life too. Blaze jumped from the ship and stood in midair while his ship proceeded to sail ahead. Blaze and Sakazuki looked at each other, there were sparkles in the air while everyone in the surrounding began to feel hot. None of them made the move but the pressure itself began to suffocate the ordinary marines. The marine soldiers on Sakazuki's ship gulped a little. They didn't expect the captain level officer would induce fear in them. They had been in countless battles but facing Blaze's lone figure, they felt different. What are you all doing? Fire at the ship. No criminals should escape today. Sakazuki. Ordered and leapt from the ship. Blaze took action. Flame surged from his hands and concentrating them on his fist, he punched the sea below them. Boom. A dense column of fire burst from both his fist and hit the water below. The extreme temperature steamed the water into mist, engulfing the entire region. Since it's nightfall, the mist perfectly concealed the area and acted as a cover. Soon, Blaze's entire unit along with the ship disappeared from their view. We missed them. Target their last position and fire. Marine officers commanded the soldiers to fire blindly. Since they were near the port of Nanohana, their confrontation attracted the residents of the town. What's happening? The residents discussed but they couldn't see as the mist concealed their sight. Blaze didn't wait for Sakazuki and began to launch his best attack. As he knew wasting and stalling time isn't going to do any good. Flames erupted from his body and swirled around him in overpowering momentum. The heat is so intense, the marines present on Sakazuki's ship began to perspire heavily. 
Even Sakazuki creased his brows as he was surprised by Blaze's strength. He could tell the temperature of the flames is close to his magma ability. The flames around Blaze massed around a single point and began to take shape. A flame bird materialized, it was as tall as a six feet human with a huge wingspan. The flame bird was a fiery red with golden fumes around its edges. It doesn't look like a scary existence but more like a noble creature. This is. The marines on board were awestruck but Blaze's ability. Not just them, the onlooking residents were also stunned by the sudden appearance of a huge flame bird. Though mist shrouded their vision, it was hard to miss the fiery thing fluttering in the sky. Sakazuki. With a huge roar, Blaze commanded the fiery bird to attack Sakazuki who stood before his ship. The flame bird flew towards Sakazuki and breathed a huge blast. The flames rushed forward rapidly carrying intense force and extreme heat. Facing the attack, the marines behind Sakazuki were scared witless as if their end is coming. But Sakazuki stood in his place and countered the strike with his own. Dog biting crimson lotus. Sakazuki's fist transformed into pure magma shaped like a fanged dog head and expanded towards the flames akin to rocket completely shattering it apart. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Sakazuki's attack didn't stop after blasting apart the flame breath, it continued forward and struck the fiery bird fluttering in midair. Bang! The impact created a shockwave that carried extreme heat. Upon collision, the fiery bird was fragmented into countless small crimson flames and rained upon Sakazuki and the marines behind him. Flame control? It's a skill Blaze gained after much practice. He can control the flames within a certain range even without contact. It's not similar to Awakening, he made it possible thanks to his perfect heat manipulation. His body emits high heat that spreads around and covers a specific range. Within this range, he can control the flames but only to a certain degree. No, it's falling on us, everyone take cover. A marine officer commanded while the marine soldiers on board escaped from the flames by running away from them. Since the flames didn't have much force, they just set everything on fire upon contact. Without bothering about the marines behind him, Sakazuki rushed towards Blaze and punched. His magma turned fist blasted towards him in full force. Blaze countered the strike with his own, by punching a dense column of fire. The flames turned into the shape of fist and smashed against Sakazuki's magma fist. Boom. The collision triggered a huge explosion and inflated a heat shockwave that expanded in all directions. The heat engulfed everything within 500 meters and turned into a volcanic region. Even the residents of Nanohana town some distance away from the battle felt the scorching temperature. It didn't stop Blaze and Sakazuki from engaging against one another, they continued to struggle. Sakazuki exploded another wave of magma into his fist while Blaze did the same. A-H-H. Roaring atop of his lungs, Blaze raised the flame temperature and forced the flames into his fist as fast as he could. A single confrontation is enough to gauge Sakazuki's magma ability, the temperature of his magma is much intense than his flames but it's not enough to punch a hole in his attack as he did to Ace. Soon, Blaze's fist knocked the magma away. It doesn't mean Blaze is as strong as Sakazuki, as he knows the latter didn't coat his attack with Haki. If he did, Blaze would have lost his advantage. Moreover, his flames are slightly weaker than Sakazuki's. It didn't discourage Blaze as he knows the temperature of his flames will increase once his Devil Fruit potential attribute crosses the 40 bar limit. In truth, Sakazuki was shocked by Blaze's Devil Fruit power. He thought his magma will triumph over Blaze's flame but it failed. Meaning, Blaze's flame is as strong as his magma. What he didn't know is, Blaze's flame is not as strong as his magma but he had superior control over his heat manipulation. Your Devil Fruit has potential and you improve quickly but today's the last day of life. Sakazuki arrogantly claimed and rushed forward. Sakazuki was fast. Swoosh. In the blink of an eye, he crossed the gap between them and arrived before him while his face and arms dripped with magma. Daifunka, Sakazuki's signature skill. His pure magma fist punched him, though Blaze blocked the attack with both his hands, the magma blasted him away. The magma ability didn't hurt him in any way but the force behind the strike hurt him. Wiping away the blood trail from the corner of his lips, Blaze stared at Sakazuki. Even without using Haki, he's powerful. The difference between them is great. He can fight with brute force but against Logia fruit it's of no use. He could tell Sakazuki is playing with him and he will finish him off once he gets bored. It's a losing fight, still, Blaze will strive till his last breath. He can flee but if he does that, Sakazuki will target his unit and the escaped world noble slaves. The only thing he can do now is, fight. Winning or losing doesn't matter to him now. Since it came to this, let me fight to my heart content. As he sorted out his thoughts, a strong conviction flashed in his eyes, the decisiveness to meet death. Till now even though Blaze always said he didn't fear death, somewhere in his heart he didn't want to die. But now, confronting Sakazuki who he can't defeat with his present strength, his heart grew determined than ever. Opening his status panel, Blaze directly raised his constitution attribute from 36.1 to 40 with the 4 free attribute points. He didn't raise his devil fruit power because it won't help him much in this situation. As for his constitution, it will help him to combat Sakazuki's haki. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 40.1. Devil fruit potential, 35.4. Haki, none. Items in storage, none. Free attribute point, zero. His entire body brimmed with life energy. A mysterious power coursed through every nook and corner of his being and improved his constitution to a whole new level. Endless vitality, explosive power, endless stamina that's how Blaze feels right now. But he knows it's nothing but a misconception from the sudden increase in strength. He got stronger. It's the truth. His physical powers may be comparable to some of the strongest characters in the One Piece world right now. The improvement in the constitution attribute also raised his devil fruit potential to another two points. They were increased from 33.4 to 35.4. 
Aside from himself, the only person who felt his quantitative transformation is Sakazuki. With his haki, he could tell Blaze got stronger but he couldn't understand how. Even so, it didn't stop him from attacking as he could tell it won't change the outcome of the battle in any way. Sakazuki transformed his entire body into magma and surrounded Blaze, intending to incinerate him into ashes by immersing him in magma. Unfortunately, it didn't even make Blaze sweat much less burn him. Sakazuki, your magma can't hurt me, it's useless to fight me with your devil fruit power. Saying this, Blaze effortlessly escaped the besiegement by jumping high in the sky. Lifting his arm, Blaze gathered the flames around his hand forming a miniature sun. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Sakazuki didn't envision that his magma ability will fail to burn Blaze. This is the first time it happened as even Kuzan's ice vaporizes immediately when meeting his magma. Is it because his devil fruit is related to heat? Just as Sakazuki contemplates, Blaze completed preparing his attack. Above Blaze's head, two miniature golden suns hovered in midair glowing fiercely. Since it is nightfall, the sun had already set but suddenly two new suns appeared in the sky lightning the entire region. The sight stunned everyone, whether it's marines or residents of the Alabasta Kingdom. Even the escaping Blaze unit noticed the change. It's Captain Blaze's ability. Regis muttered while Eri and Sia wondered at the sight. Sakazuki too observed the two sons but unlike others, there wasn't even a shred of surprise on his face, only indifference and disdain. Sakazuki's magma won't hurt him and the same could be said about his flames. Blaze knew, but he had to at least try before deciding that. To hurt Sakazuki, the temperature of his flames had to be higher than magma. So, unlike his conventional attacks, he decided to try something different and new. The two sons gained power by compressing more heat into them, to the point of explosion. Looking at Sakazuki, Blaze attacked. Both the sons suddenly projected a scorching ray that convened in midair and then blasted towards Sakazuki with increased intensity as a single fiery beam. Twin Sun, Super Heat Beam. The beam was too big for Sakazuki to evade in time but the thing is, he didn't plan on avoiding it in the first place and chose to confront it head-on. It didn't surprise Blaze that much as he knows Sakazuki's personality, he isn't the type of person to run away from something. Dark Hound. Sakazuki transformed his magma hand into a claw and drove against the approaching laser-like beam. In the series, he pierced Whitebeard's body and then detonated, filling the latter's stomach with magma. The blow severely injured Whitebeard. But against Blaze's new attack, he failed. In turn, the laser beam pierced his magma claw and struck his body blasting him far away. Crash. Sakazuki's figure zoomed back and directly smashed into his marine ship destroying a part of it. Gray smoke engulfed the ship and prevented others from seeing what's happening. Soon, Sakazuki walked out of the smoke without any visible damage but Blaze noticed blood dripping from the ladder's fist that met his fiery beam. It worked. Blaze was shocked a little. He knew it's because Sakazuki didn't coat his arms with haki. Nonetheless, it's great progress. Glancing at his injured arm, Sakazuki frowned. Though it's just a scratch, the attack caught him completely off guard. It's time to send you to hell. Saying this, Sakazuki flew towards Blaze while his part of his body transformed into magma. He coated his arms with haki and punched at Blaze's face. Tekai hardening his muscles, Blaze blocked the attack by crossing his arms but the impact knocked him backward. His right arm was bruised and dripped with blood. If he hadn't raised his constitution attribute to 40, the haki-powered strike would have completely crippled his arm. He escaped the strike with a slight injury but how many more minutes he can withstand Sakazuki's attacks? Blaze doesn't know. His mastery over Tekai is still shallow, he couldn't bring out its true strength. Though Tekai skill had its limit, he can counterbalance it over with his Senju constitution that grants abnormal physical strength and vitality. Sakazuki didn't wait, he rushed at Blaze and attack. Raising his hands, he fired off a great number of magma fists coating it with haki. As Blaze was in close range, he couldn't dodge all the rapid projectile-like attacks. He was able to evade one or two but remaining crashed against his body precisely. Hardening his entire body, Blaze used Soru ability to escape but Sakazuki predicted his every move with his observation haki. All his efforts proved futile. Soon, a barrage of magmic fists drowned Blaze completely smashing against his body. Sakazuki only stopped his attacks after continuing for a minute. The entire area is filled with mist and smoke as Sakazuki's magma and Blaze's flame ability vaporized part of the sea below them. Smoke dispersed revealing Blaze's bloody figure. Though Blaze blocked part of the attack by forming a heat shield around him, it didn't help against haki-powered attack. Blood trickled from all parts of his body as his skin and muscles were cracked in multiple places. Both his hands were injured beyond definition as Blaze resisted the attack by placing both his hand before him. The bones in his hands were crushed into multiple fragments. It's a miracle he still stands, only thanks to his Senju constitution. Without knowing Haki, he can't injure Sakazuki no matter how much many times he attacks. It's a hopeless situation for Blaze as he can't even use his hands now. But, his gaze was still as determined as ever. Impressive? You are still alive but won't be for long. You would have been a wonderful marine if not for your ridiculous justice. Saying this, Sakazuki decided to finish Blaze off with his signature skill Great Eruption. His right arm transformed into a pure, giant magma fist before expanding towards him like a speeding rocket. Even in the face of death, Blaze neither showed fear or panic in his face but absolute calmness and decisiveness to counterattack. So what if I can't use my fist? Blaze flared his right leg and kicked at the incoming giant magma fist. A dense column of flames erupted from his leg and confronted Sakazuki's attack. Both the strikes clashed in midair sending a heat shockwave that spread in all directions. Whether it's marines or residents of Alabasta, all of them felt the impact while heat waves burned their skins. Sakazuki's attack was imbued with haki while Blaze put everything in the strike attack. Ah, uh, screaming aloud, Blaze increased the intensity of the flame and drew out every bit of strength left in his body. Flames surged from his body endlessly enhancing the attack. 
To onlookers, it was a remarkable display as fiery flames and magma confronted for the best in midair. Without Blaze's knowing, an overpowering momentum burst out of him and expanded in every direction. Since only marines were present in the area, the weak-willed ones were directly knocked unconscious. Only a handful resisted the momentum, even they were forced to their knees. What's happening? An officer raised his doubts. I am losing my strength. This is, how's Hoku no Haki, a commodore of the ship commented, before falling to his knees. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Endless flames surged from Blaze's leg without stop and engulfed everything around 500 meters transforming into a sea of fire. He's one resilient bastard even though he's very weak. Sakazuki snorted a little and exerted much force while thrusting more magma into the attack. His magma pushed Blaze's flames away and strived forward to strike. Soon, a thunderous bang resounded while blood splattered. Ultimately, Sakazuki's hacky powered strike triumphed while his giant magma fist smashed Blaze straight into the sea, completely knocking him unconscious. The attack tore his inner organs and crushed most of his bones. It won't be an exaggeration to say that he's on brink of death. Discerning Blaze still breathes with his observation hacky, Sakazuki muttered, How's Hoku hacky? You are similar to that garp. Your kind of justice is a shame to the marines who need to erase every criminal without any sympathy. You even let Fisher Tiger who freed countless criminals escape. The entirety of his arm transformed into hardened magma something that no one had seen before. Hardened magma took the shape of a pointed spike, imbuing them with hacky, he smashed it towards where Blaze fell. Blaze's body floated in the ocean completely unconscious, unaware a strike that can take his life approaches him. At the last moment, a figure zoomed past the attack while Blaze disappeared. The one who arrived is none other than Kuzan. He wore an indigo coat with the marine emblem on the left chest and the back, as well as a dark blue bandana with a white marine symbol on it and a pair of black round sunglasses. Arara, Sakazuki, what are you doing, trying to kill a fellow marine? Kuzan held Blaze's bloody figure in his right hand and faced Sakazuki. Blaze's entire being is painted in blood, while his face had a huge dent in them. Sakazuki's last strike is truly vicious as he didn't even hold back a little. If not for Blaze's Senju constitution he would have already died. Even so, his situation is critical. Most of the bones in his body were broken while his inner organs were ripped in multiple places. Kuzan, don't intervene in my matters. He has to die today, his way of thinking is deemed as a threat to the world government. Hearing it, Kuzan frowned. Don't tell me someone from world government want Blaze dead. Shaking his head, Kuzan spoke, from what I see, he isn't a threat to anyone but you. Are you afraid of him getting stronger? Sakazuki grunted to his ridiculous question and uttered, since you decided to stand in my way, I will kill you along with him. Why don't you try it? Kuzan spoke while Frost covered his hands and legs, chilling the area. Before they could confront, Sengoku's voice came from Kuzan's pocket. Kuzan then took out a denden mushy that resembles Sengoku. Enough, Sakazuki, you are trying to kill a fellow marine without any orders, is this how a vice admiral acts? Get back to the headquarters. Sakazuki clenched his fist and gritted his teeth, but eventually, he turned around and walked away. He's just a vice admiral now, he can't act as he wishes. Only when he becomes an admiral, he has that power. Of course, characters like Garp and Suru are different. Kuzan, you bring Blaze back and send him to the infirmary. Okay. Kuzan ended the call and looked at barely breathing Blaze. Though he arrived only seconds before Sakazuki dealt his final blow, he was impressed by Blaze's actions. He was daring and courageous as he stood alone to face Sakazuki so that his unit and the world noble slaves can leave. Wasting no time, he carried Blaze and hurried towards headquarters understanding the dire state he is in. Both Kuzan and Sakazuki left. The entire sky was filled with smoke and heat, proof of the battle that happened here. The residents of the Nanohana town were the most perplexed ones as they didn't even know what happened, aside from the fact some people are fighting. The fight didn't last long since Blaze was too weak compared to Sakazuki. But, the next time they fight it will be different. Marine Headquarters Three days have passed since the battle between Blaze and Sakazuki, but Blaze still hadn't regained his consciousness yet. It's because of the degree of damage he sustained, his mind automatically shut his consciousness as it's too severe. Today, Blaze slowly regained his consciousness and opened his eyes. He feels as if he woke from a long dream and a thought crossed his mind. I am still alive. Then, an excruciating pain spread from various parts of his body, even with his good willpower and pain tolerance, he couldn't help but cry out a little. Especially his arms, he couldn't even feel them as if they aren't there. It somewhat frightened him a little. Only then he noticed the surroundings and his mummified appearance. Thankfully, his arms were still there. It's just they were injured critically. It didn't affect him in any way as he knew with his Senja constitution he will gradually recover and back to his full strength in a few days. It's the advantage of raising his constitution attribute to 40. Just as Blaze was feeling the injuries in his body, young medical personnel came inside and was astonished to see him up and conscious. You are awake. Good, I will call the doctor. Saying this, the young man went to call the doctor. In a few minutes, Blaze saw Fishbonin entering the room decked in a white coat and carries a notepad. It's surprising that you regained consciousness considering the degree of wounds. How do you feel? Fishbonin asked. I can't feel my arms, Blaze said looking at his fully bandaged arms fastened against his chest. Your arms are crushed completely with shattered bones. But you don't have to worry, I noticed incredible healing power in your body. They will heal if you eat and rest properly for few days. Blaze simply nodded his head. Crushing defeat against Sakazuki taught him many things and the importance of Haki. Haki stands far above the devil fruit power. Even if one had heaven-defying strength, without Haki, they won't amount much. Next day, most of Blaze's injury healed to a certain extent that he can barely get out of his bed and walk. The only troubling thing is his arms, the recovery is quite slow. He still can't feel them. Just as he was contemplating what he should next, Garp came to visit him. 
The old man had a grin on his face as if he was enjoying his predicament. Wahahaha, Blaze brat, you look great. Hearing the sentence, Blaze's lips twitched. In what way I look great? I want to learn hacky, can you teach me? He asked without hiding his thoughts. You want to beat Sakazuki? Garp asked narrowing his eyes. Yes, that bastard nearly killed me. Blaze calmly replied. Even if I want to teach you hacky, you are in no position to learn them. Your actions grabbed world government's attention, they severely condemned Sengoku for supporting you. Garp said shaking his head. Blaze wasn't surprised as he knew it would happen but he didn't expect that Sengoku would be implicated by it. It means the latter took the blame in his stead. But why? I am the one who did it. Blaze asked. What you did is no small matter since involves the world nobles. They want the slaves back but you helped them to escape. If Sengoku didn't take the blame, you will definitely be dismissed from your position and sent to impel down for your crimes. Hearing this, Blaze was silent. He always thought Sengoku won't support his way of doing things but he didn't expect the latter would go so far as to protect him. His actions stirred his heart as he knew what it means. Sengoku may even lose his promotion to become a fleet admiral. Still, you are not escaping this incident without any punishment. For your crime, you were demoted by two ranks while your merit points were subtracted to zero. Now, you are just a lieutenant commander. Furthermore, you will be sent to one of the four blues for few years to reflect on your actions. Garp spoke about Blaze's current situation while inwardly he's displeased about the decision. In his opinion, this kind of punishment is a little heavy since it's equivalent to cutting off Blaze's future path. By the time he comes back from the four blues, he had to start all over again and advance his way forward in the ranks. But no one can do anything since the punishment was decided by Fleet Admiral Kong after discussing with the world government. Blaze wasn't depressed by the punishment as Garp expected. To him, marine ranks, merit points are just a way to get stronger, even without them he can become strong. Once he becomes strong, he can get them back in no time. After conversing with him for a few more minutes, Garp left the room. As for Blaze, he pondered for a minute and decided to learn hacky in his own way. Since none in the Marines plan on teaching him, he will find a way on his own. His first choice is to visit Old Man Magnus and ask him if the latter also rejects his request, he can only look for other ways. After Garp left, Regis came to visit him. He told him the escaped world noble salves they carried to the Alabasta Kingdom were recaptured by the Marines. It enraged Blaze but Regis's next sentence somewhat calmed his heart. I safely sent Eri and Sia to their homes, after finding the Marines are searching for them, I helped them relocate to a different island. Regis then recounted what happened after Blaze was taken away from Kizan. Unlike Regis, Jado revealed the other three people's whereabouts and for his service, he was promoted by one rank. Blaze was disappointed by his actions but won't blame him, since his actions saved the other marine soldiers in his unit from any sort of punishment aside from Regis. What about you? Blaze asked. Since I didn't reveal the location of the other two slaves, I was naturally punished and demoted to Ensign, Regis replied. Thanks, Regis. Blaze won't forget his help. Only in difficult situations, you will see the true faces of the people around you. Captain Blaze, I decided to follow you. I don't care about your rank or where you are sent. I believe in your strength and justice. Hearing this, Blaze laughed. It feels good to have a trusted comrade beside you. Blaze stayed in the healing center for another day before leaving the place against Fishbonin's instruction. Exiting the healing center, he headed to Sengoku's office. He didn't thank him for taking the blame but he will by his actions in the future, Blaze can't let him down after what the latter had done. What are you doing here, you haven't fully recovered yet. Go back. Sengoku frowned at his reckless action. Don't worry about them, Sengoku-san. They will heal in no time. I came to apply for a leave. For what? Personal reasons. How many days? Three months. Blaze responded without batting an eyelid. Before Sengoku could question, he spoke again. Personal reasons. Hearing his answer, Sengoku had the urge to beat him but suppressed his impulse considering the state of his injuries. He didn't reject Blaze's request as his wounds need time to heal, especially his arms. After thinking for a moment, he granted them. After getting Sengoku's permission, Blaze departed from the Marine headquarters without saying goodbye to anyone. Only Garb, Sengoku, and Regis know. Even they don't know where he was going. As for his relocation, he was tasked to guard the East Blue but he will only take the post after three months. Neither Garp nor Sengoku stopped him as they thought Blaze was disheartened after his defeat. But, in truth, he wasn't distressed by the loss. After all, losing is also part of a game. Accepting the loss is also a kind of win. Leaving the headquarters, Blaze headed straight to the volcanic island where he met Old Man Magnus. Sengoku's office. Do you know where he's going? Sengoku asked, sipping a tea. Who knows, Garp nonchalantly replied without care. But what I know is, he's searching for the strength to beat Sakazuki. The next time we meet, he won't be the same person we know. So, why do you want him in East Blue? Sengoku asked. East Blue is peaceful, he will like it there. But Sengoku didn't believe in his answer, are you planning on teaching him Haki secretly? Of course not. Garp replied, looking elsewhere. For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Marine headquarters. The next day an article regarding Sakazuki and Blaze dispute was published in the newspaper that circulated the world. The article was about the fight between two marines and the reason behind it. The good thing is, the article didn't mention the names if they had, it would easily destroy marine prestige. But, it had a huge impact on the marine soldiers. As most of them know about the battle that happened between Blaze and Sakazuki, cracks begin to form between the believers of absolute justice and moral justice. Some praised Blaze for supporting innocent people, while some condemned him for violating the world government's order. For the first time, Blaze's name spread among the marines and made an impression in their hearts. Fergo, Shizo, John, and other friends of Blaze's also learned about it. 
Still, the news didn't have a deep impact among the high-ranking officers of the Marines. To them, it's just a small matter that isn't even worth their attention, because the stage they are playing is much bigger compared to the first half of the Grand Line. As for Blaze, he reached the volcanic island the next day, where Black D. Magnus lives. The island looked the same, covered in gray smoke and unbearable heat. Without any hesitation, he made his way into the island. He soon reached the giant volcanic mountain located at the center and noticed the figure of Magnus. The old figure of Magnus could be seen barbecuing a huge fish that emits a mild fragrance. Without even looking back, he spoke, come, have a seat. Blaze walked and sat on the other side of the barbecue. Eyeing Blaze, Magnus commented, you look pretty beaten up. What happened? Without hiding anything, Blaze recounted the things and why he was in such a state. Magma fruit? I have some impression of it. You were nearly killed and punished because you wanted to save the innocents. Yes. So, you came here to learn hacky from me. Blaze nodded his head and said, without strength, I can't change anything. Though I am stronger than before, only now I feel truly weak. Magnus as if understood his words surprisingly agreed to the request without any second thought. I will teach you hacky, but on one condition. Blaze was overjoyed as he didn't expect the other party would agree easily. Holding his happiness, he asked, what condition? My request is very simple, whatever happens in the future don't side with the world government. Blaze chuckled, you know I won't do that. I know and this may seem silly but I had to say this considering your current status as marine. After all, people change over time in the pursuit of power. I understand but you don't have to worry about this, Blaze said. By the time the conversation ended, the fish over the fire was finally grilled and ready to savor. Serving a large piece to Blaze, Magnus asked, what do you know about Haki? Blaze recalled everything he knew about Haki and replied, Haki is a mysterious power that allows one to utilize their own spiritual energy for various purposes. Perfect answer? Haki is nothing but a person's spiritual energy. Tell me more. Magnus asked. I know Haki originates from one spirit and not their physical body. It is utilized in three different ways, armament Haki represents one's fighting spirit. Observation Haki represents one's spiritual presence and finally conquerors Haki defines one's willpower. It's all I know about Haki. Good. You already have a good grasp of what is Haki but that's what limits your imagination. For now, let's forget about different types of Haki and discuss the basic concept. You knew Haki is nothing but one's spiritual energy but do you know how it comes? I would say strong belief or unyielding obsession. The greater your willpower, the stronger your Haki. It's also why all the conquerors Haki users are powerful than normal Haki users. Magnus explained while Blaze listened. He continued, all living beings in the world are capable of controlling their spiritual energy but most people fail to sense them. Do you know why? Blaze thought for a moment and replied, because they don't have a firm mind or determination. Wrong? Everyone is obsessed or stubborn over something in their life, which means they are qualified to learn Haki. Magnus. Then, Blaze was puzzled. It's because of doubt, unbelief, and ignorance. Most of the common people consider themselves as ordinary and they don't even know about Haki. If they don't even know what is Haki, how will they control it? Of course, there are exceptions as some awaken Haki without even knowing and some are born with it. What I am trying to say is, don't ever doubt yourself or your purpose. It's the strength of spiritual energy. Understand. Yes, Blaze nodded his head. In your case, you already awakened your conqueror's Haki. Meaning, your spiritual energy is ready for use. It's just you don't know how to sense them. How to feel them. Blaze asked. Sensing Haki is the hardest part. Most people fail at this stage and I have seen people who had taken years just to sense their Haki. Spiritual energy is a mysterious power that's dormant in all beings, so to feel them, you need to believe in yourself. Is this the only way? Blaze asked. He knew Haki can also be practiced by intense training or by extreme shock. No, there are other ways to sense Haki, training, stimulating one's emotions, or fighting. But the conventional way is to sense Haki by oneself. By going this way, the sense of control over your Haki will be excellent and you will get a good idea of what is spiritual energy. Perceive everything from the source. For example, how do you think the first person learned his Haki when there's no one to teach? Old man Magnus explained many things about Haki that subverted Blaze's understanding. And, the next step is to sense them but how? For advanced chapters, check out my p.a.t.r.e.o.n page. I have 30 plus advanced chapters there. Patreon.com slash fan if I see mortal. Follow my instructions? Close your eyes and sit in a position that you are most comfortable. Magnus guided. Now, relax your body. Blaze sat cross-legged, shut the eyes, and relaxed his body. Magnus carried on with his instructions while he followed suit without missing any details. Follow your breathing, try to perceive the energy within you. The energy can be anything, a feeling, color, word, image, or something similar. Blaze followed his guidance and sought to feel the energy but he couldn't sense anything. He knew it's like meditation, it can't be achieved in a single day. You may not be able to sense the spiritual energy immediately, but it doesn't mean your talent is poor. It takes time and will get easier as you repeat the process. Magnus' voice reached Blaze's ear as he fails to sense his spiritual energy even after trying for half an hour. Take some break and then continue. Hearing it, Blaze slowly opened his eyes and reflected. He first needs to stop the wandering thoughts and should learn to focus his mind entirely on one thing. After relaxing for 15 minutes, Blaze continued and repeated the process. As he practiced, again and again, he finally touched something but it was just for a fleeting moment. Two days passed. Most of his injuries healed, except for his arms. If Blaze isn't wrong, they need another five days to completely heal. As for Magnus, he didn't give him any hint after the instructions. So, it's up to him to sense the spiritual energy. Unlike before, he would sense something every time he tries to feel his spiritual energy but that feeling would soon disappear. He wasn't able to grasp them completely. Like every other time, Blaze closed his eyes and relaxed his body to feel the energy. 
Without knowing, his thoughts were completely cleared up while his mind reached the state of emptiness. It happened suddenly and it was just for a second, but that short time frame helped Blaze to feel his spiritual energy. It was a golden ball of mysterious energy with silver luster around its edges. Is this my spiritual energy? Before he could rejoice, he lost the feeling and everything returned to normal. Even so, Blaze was thrilled. Jumping to his feet, he exclaimed. Old man Magnus, I just felt my spiritual energy. It was a golden ball of energy with silver radiance. What? Magnus was shocked. Though his back was hunched and he carried a walking stick, his speed was fast as he flashed next to Blaze at breakneck speed. Tell me about the process. Blaze then recounted everything but nothing seemed different. It somewhat mystified Magnus, as he knew it's impossible to sense the spiritual energy in such a short time. Even he, who was considered a prodigy took a month to sense his spiritual energy. How did he do it in mere two days, is something different about him. I think you are innately gifted in learning Hacky. Let's proceed to the next step. Magnus' eagerness to teach Hacky was one step higher than Blaze's enthusiasm to learn. He wants to see in how many days will Blaze learn the next step. Wasting no time, he spoke about the next step. Remember the feeling of sensing your spiritual energy and repeat the process. You should first understand that it's your spiritual energy and they are part of you. Only you have the power to control them. Magnus guided in the next step while Blaze listened carefully and executed according to his direction. But it wasn't easy as he couldn't sense the spiritual energy again, no matter how many times he tried. Thankfully, old man Magnus was there to guide him. During the failure, he will motivate and share some of his experiences of sensing the spiritual energy. It helped him a lot. Now he understands why it's nearly impossible to learn Hacky without someone's guidance. It didn't take long for Blaze to sense and feel his spiritual energy. He was just a step away from completing the next step. According to Magnus, he should have successfully completed this step when he was able to feel his spiritual energy with a thought. Spiritual energy is a part of me, like arms and legs, it's always there. It should come naturally, feeling and controlling them. Blaze pondered upon his failures and improved quickly. Days passed, soon it's been 15 days since Blaze came to this island. His body recovered and healed with no hidden wounds, even his scars disappeared. It's the power of his Senja constitution. His strength returned to its peak while his attributes also raised slightly, thanks to the battle against Sakazuki. Blaze successfully completed the next step feeling the spiritual energy with a thought. It's only been a day since he finished this step but he got a complete hang of it. Magnus was shocked but he didn't express it in his face. After 10 days of observation, he inferred why Blaze can sense and feel his hacky in a short period. It's true Blaze is a talented person but it's not why he was able to learn hacky quickly, it's because of his strange constitution. At first, Magnus didn't notice it, but after Blaze began to feel his spiritual energy, it came to light. With his observation hacky, he could feel Blaze's surging vitality and endless power contained within his body. In this world, there are various kinds of races with strange and special physiques so this finding didn't astound him that much. He thinks Blaze is different. Magnus didn't hide this, he directly told his findings to the latter. It came as a surprise to Blaze. No wonder, it's because of the Senja bloodline. It cleared his head and new theories popped in his head. Once you learn to control your hacky, we will be able to find the full extent of the abilities granted by your physique. Magnus expressed his thoughts. Good, shall we proceed to the next step? Blaze asked. Yes. Magnus agreed while he inwardly shook his head. The process which would have taken a few months was completed by Blaze in few days. If this goes on like this, I won't have anything to teach him after two or three months. Magnus' intuition tells him that Blaze will become a formidable hacky user that the world hadn't seen before. His powers will soon shock the world. World government will have a hard time dealing with him once they became his enemy. It's going to be fun. The hard part is over which is feeling your hacky. The next step is simple, harnessing the power of hacky. You already know hacky is used in three different forms, fighting spirit, presence, and intimidation. Usually, people learn to feel their hacky by training in any one form of hacky, either armament or observation. It's also the reason why many people excel in one form of hacky. But, you are different. You already learned to feel your hacky. It's your advantage and it won't limit your imagination when you began to learn the other forms. Magnus explained. Blaze was puzzled as he couldn't understand what Magnus was trying to say. How is it different? Isn't it all the same? Noticing his confusion, Magnus smiled, let me demonstrate in simple terms. Hacky isn't all about coating your arms or observing your opponents, it's much more. Watch me. Saying this, he closed his eyes. Suddenly, Blaze sensed a mysterious power in the surrounding, brushing past him. He can't see it but can feel it, it's old man Magnus' hacky. The next second, the stones sprawled around him rocked a little and began to float. How? Telekinesis? Old Magnus can control the objects around him with his hacky? Unbelievable. Soon, all the floating stones swirled at high speed but halfway all of them dropped to the floor without support. Seeing this, Blaze looked at Magnus. The latter shook his head with a fatigued expression. My hacky has grown weak over the years and I still can't control the objects with just spiritual energy. This is what I want to say to you. Don't limit your hacky with the knowledge around you. Hacky is nothing but belief. This time Blaze completely understands what Magnus was trying to say. He needs to believe in the impossible to make it possible. If he doesn't even believe it, nothing will change. Hacky is just spiritual energy while its application is not limited to fighting and observing. It can do wonders if grasped correctly. The new finding somewhat excited Blaze very much. Magnus once again spoke, interrupting his thoughts. Don't let your thoughts wander, this kind of practice is too far away for you. I showed this so that you don't limit your imagination, nothing more. Blaze nodded his head in understanding. He wasn't a reckless fool to think he can do that after practicing for a few days. Now, let's talk about how to harness your hacky which is a basic and foundation of controlling one's spiritual energy. 
First, view Sashoku Armament Haki forming an invisible armor around yourself with your spiritual energy. It may seem simple but Armament Haki is the most difficult of three forms. You need to consider many things since reckless use of Armament Haki drains your spiritual energy fast. Unlike Observation and Conqueror's Haki, a person's spiritual energy is limited like stamina, it will eventually run out on continuous use. To deal with that, you need to understand the term Haki Reserve. Haki reserve is nothing but the amount of spiritual energy a person possesses. Usually, it's the same for every person at the start with a slight change but there are some exceptions. Haki reserve can be improved by constant practice, battle, or even emotional changes. But mostly, it's by practice one can increase their haki reserve. I am speaking about this haki reserve concept because the amount of spiritual energy you possess is at least three times of a normal person. It's surprising. Is it because I got transmigrated and swallowed the previous owner's soul? Blaze thought. Magnus continued his explanation. Whatever the case may be, it's your advantage. Now, let's get back to the topic of armament haki. To coat your body with haki, you need to learn how to harness and channel your spiritual energy. It's the same concept as punch. When you punch, you channel your entire strength to your fist. Let's start. Try to touch your spiritual energy and let it flow. Blaze did as Magnus instructed. Time flew by, one month passed. After a month of rigorous training, he was finally able to harness and channel his spiritual energy. It didn't come easy, he worked hard for it. Blaze can coat his arms with haki but it was imperfect and unstable. In this one month, Magnus also taught him other two forms of haki, observation and conqueror's haki. Under Magnus' supervision, Blaze coated his arms with haki and punched at the huge boulder in front of him. Just as his fist was about to strike the rock, his haki wore off. Magnus shook his head. Watch me. Saying this, he covered his arms with haki and showed Blaze. Did you notice anything? No. You are forcing and pressuring your spiritual energy too much, it should feel natural. You need further practice in harnessing and channeling your haki, Magnus suggested. Next, Blaze practiced his observation haki. The training method is similar, he closed his eyes and began to sense his surrounding with his spiritual energy. He wasn't at the stage where he can dodge the attacks while blindfolded. For that, he first needs to understand how to use his observation haki. After two hours of practice in observation haki, Magnus switched Blaze's training to conqueror's haki. To Blaze, it was the most relaxed training. Here, he doesn't have to control his haki but let them all erupt at once. For now, Magnus wants him to get used to his willpower. It was fun but also a little challenging. Days flew by, another 15 days passed. Blaze's control over Haki improved every day, his terrifying growth even shocked Magnus who had become numb by now. Blaze grasped the complete basics of armament and observation Haki. He can now coat his arms with Haki but it's still stiff and needs further practice. Compared to that, his observation Haki is stable. He can sense the things and movements around him even with his eyes closed. With the basics learned, he can now proceed to the next step, battle. Only during the battle his Haki will develop. He knew it very well and Magnus also said the same thing. The problem is, there's no opponent on this barren island. And, his three-month vacation time limit is also getting near. In a month, he has to resume his duty as a marine. His situation is hopeless as there isn't any worthy opponent in the East Blue. Just as he was feeling low, a notification sounded in his mind. Task, learn Haki Basics Kanbunshoko plus Bisashoko. Time limit, 2 years. Status, completed. Reward, 10.0 Haki points plus 2.0 free attribute points. Viewing the notification, Blaze was beyond excited. The reward came at a perfect time just as he was feeling lost. Accepting the reward, he checked his status panel. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 41.2. Devil Fruit Potential, 36.4 Haki, 15.3 Items in Storage, None Free Attribute Point, 2.0 As soon as he accepted the reward, there was a change in his spiritual level. His spiritual energy improved a little while some of his doubts regarding Haki unraveled themselves. Amazing. Blaze clenched his fist, feeling his control over Haki. The Haki Attribute Point improves his Haki control, reserve, and strengthens his spiritual energy. But, it won't help him in unlocking the techniques. For example, he can't see the future with his observation Haki just by raising his Haki points. He can only comprehend them by himself with training. Blaze then checked his attribute panel. His Haki attribute had increased from 5.3 points to 15.3 points. Yes, before accepting the reward he had 5.3 Haki points. The sudden reward of 10 Haki points came at the right time. With this, he will have an easier time learning some advanced concepts of Haki from Magnus. The next day, how did you do it? Magnus asked with a dazed look. He couldn't believe his eyes, seeing Blaze control his Haki. His Haki control improved by a notch in just one day? How is it possible? Magnus racked his brain but couldn't find the answer. He finally sighed. I getting too old. Blaze didn't answer his question but simply scratched his head and looked clueless. Magnus didn't pry any further, you said you can only stay here for another 15 days right? Yes. It's not enough for you to learn all the techniques in such a short time, you can understand them and practice in the future. Let's start with armament hacky. You already know how to coat your arms with hacky but you don't understand them completely. For example, a good hacky user would know how much hacky he should apply to his arms. Like I already said, armament hacky drains one's hacky faster. Saying this, Magnus raised his arm and coated it with hacky while his right fist turned dark gray. Watch my fist carefully. Blaze with his observation Haki noticed Magnus channeling more Haki to his fist. His arms blackened further and soon turned dark purple. The next moment, purple arcs sparkled around his fist like lightning. What astonished Blaze is the amount of Haki gathered around his arm, it was imposing. He was sure, just a blow from that fist will pulverize him to the ground. 
I have a long way to go. Magnus didn't stop there. He began to teach him about various advanced applications of armament hacky like emission and internal destruction. Blaze listened carefully and imprinted the words in his mind. After explaining about armament hacky, Magnus moved to observation hacky and then conquerors hacky. Another 15 days flew by. Blaze learned many things about advanced forms of hacky from Magnus but he needs time to practice and master them. He's still a rookie when it comes to hacky. Even so, he's not the same person who came to this island two and half months back. He has grown physically and spiritually while his strength soared to a new height. Blaze plans to leave the island today. He still has another 15 days before he had to report to duty. But, he wants to take some time off and relax. He has been constantly doing something without any rest. It's been two years since he came to the world of One Piece but he hadn't slacked for a single day. Blaze said goodbye to Magnus before departing from the island. He knew old man Magnus didn't have much time but he will surely come back before his time is up. As a parting gift, Magnus gave him a small notebook. I copied everything I know about Haki. If you face any challenges in the future, you can take a look. Accepting the notebook, Blaze turned around to leave. But he suddenly stopped in his tracks and glanced back at Magnus before stating, This time, I will definitely claim the title of the strongest man in the world. After that, I will come and visit you again. Saying this, Blaze leaped high in the air and soon vanished from Magnus' sight. Hearing his statement, Magnus just shook his head. He knew how hard his goal is, it won't be easy. Still, he believes Blaze can do it as he watched him create miracles with his own eyes. He always knew Blaze is no ordinary man. I believe, we will meet again before my time runs out. After leaving, Blaze went to the nearest human inhabited island and from there he boarded a merchant ship that sails towards the red line that separates East Blue and Grand Line. The journey was slow and relaxing as the ship stopped at the various islands before cruising towards the destination. It took him 10 days to reach the red line. From there, Blaze crossed the red line and reached Logue Town, which is few kilometers away from the reverse mountain. How would Blaze miss the chance of visiting the town of beginning and end? After all, it's the hometown of Pirate King Roger and where he was executed. Furthermore, he was supposed to take charge from the Logue Town Marine Base. Regis was also here in the town, waiting for him. The year is 1511, with only 15 days passed. The sky was cloudless and blue with the warm sunlight shining down at the Logue Town. The temperature is not too hot, as the occasional sea breeze kept the climate under control. Blaze aimlessly strolled along the busy streets of Logue Town. Aside from the common people, he noticed many pirates among the crowd who were stocking up supplies for the Grand Line journey. He didn't care about them since they weren't doing anything outrageous and minded his own business. He wants to buy some things of his own. Training equipment for practicing hacky, clothes, and a weapon. He had been thinking for some time now, it's time for him to pick a weapon. He's good at using his fist and weapons but sometimes it's better to have a weapon. He would just practice in his free time, who knows it may come in handy. Touring the town, he reached the execution platform which is located at the center of the town. Even now, many people come from all over the world to visit this place. G.O.L.D. Roger once stood at the pinnacle of this world. Without a doubt, he's the strongest person who had everything. If not for his sickness, even Whitebeard won't be his match. Blaze respects Roger's strength. He too will one day reach the pinnacle of this world. Turning around, he walked towards the arms shop owned by Ippon Matsu. It's where Zoro found the cursed sword Sande Kaititsu and Yubashiri. Blaze wants to try his luck there as the shop has been in business for over 200 years. There may be a good weapon to his liking. It didn't take long for him to reach the arms shop. Unlike in the original timeline, the shop had a lot of pirate customers. He also noticed Ippon Matsu greeting everyone with a fake smile. Only after Smoker was put in charge of the marine base on this island, he barely had any customers. Shaking his head, Blaze entered the store. He used to have multiple pirate customers that were looking to enter the Grand Line. However, since Smoker was put in charge of the marine base on the island, Ippon Matsu barely had any customers. The shop mainly sells swords, antique and new. But, they also sell other weapons like clubs, axes, flintlocks, rifles, armor, daggers, spears, and so on. The weapons in the East Blue definitely won't have good craftsmanship or made with fine materials but it's more than enough for Blaze who's buying a weapon to practice not fight. Blaze casually strolled the store and looked at the weapons. He would pick and try a weapon if it grabs his attention. After testing all types of weapons, he liked the axes. Unlike swords that felt light and plain, he prefers axes that looked imposing and heavy. In a certain sense, Escanor's style influenced him as both of them are users of sun-type ability. So, Blaze thinks he would also look cool with an axe. But, the number of axes in the store was too few and he didn't like any of them. He called Ippon Matsu and told his requirement. He added a sentence at the end. Money doesn't matter. As soon as he said those words, Ippon Matsu's eyes shined and he quickly rushed inside the store. And, he came after a minute carrying a dark silver-colored battle axe. Blaze liked the axe as soon as he laid his eyes on it. It was a double-edged battle axe with a three-foot-long metal arm while the hilt had a leather grip. Receiving the axe, he held it in his hand. It was heavy but holdable in one hand and had good length. It felt perfect. How much? One million berries. Blaze didn't waste time by bargaining, he directly placed one million berries in the latter's hand and walked out of the shop. Though he's not rich, he had around 1.5 million berries on him. To him who pursue the pinnacle of strength, money is worthless. If he lacks, he can exchange merit points for some berries. Right now, he has no merit points on his name but it can be used to exchange. If he's not wrong, one merit point equals one million berries. As for Ippon Matsu, he stood stunned on the spot clinging to the one million berries in his hand. He's rich, it would be wonderful if I have a lot of customers like him. Blaze then moved on to buy other necessary things. After getting all the stuff, he went to meet Regis near the port as he plans to join back from today. According to Sengoku, he needs to report to the current marine captain of Logue Town base before taking charge. Now, he's just a lieutenant commander. 
Still, he got certain privileges as he's from headquarters. Even the marine captain of the Logetown base won't dare to disrespect him. He found Regis at the dock. He wore a standard marina tried and cap while his silver hair is pretty eye-catching. Captain Blaze. As soon as he noticed Blaze, he came forward and saluted formally. Waving his hand, Blaze commented. When are you going to remove the honorifics? I am just a lieutenant commander. Just call me by my name. How's everyone in our old unit? Blaze asked. All of them are assigned to different units, while some are transferred to New World. They are doing fine. Good. Blaze San, are you plan on joining back today? Regis inquired while Blaze nodded. You just need to report your arrival to the Marine base, then we are good to go. Regis mentioned. Oh, that easy. Blaze raised his brows in surprise. Yes. I reported your arrival to the headquarters a few days back when you contacted me. So, everything is arranged before you came, including the crew and the ship. Is that our ship? Blaze gazed past Regis and noticed a small marine ship docked behind them. The ship's even smaller than a standard marine ship. Instead of saying a ship, it should be called a caravel since it's similar to going merry. Yes, Regis replied. Since you are a lieutenant commander, it's what we get. Blaze San, it's not the worst, you should have seen the crew assigned to us, they are a hopeless bunch. Don't worry about it. It's East Blue, weakest of all the blues, so it doesn't matter what kind of marine soldiers are designated to our ship. Next day, after formally reporting his arrival in the marine base, Blaze boarded the small marine ship assigned to him and met the hopeless bunch that Regis mentioned. Including him and Regis, they were a total of 12 members and most of them are seaman grade soldiers. None of them had a decent physique, bare-bellied, lanky, short, lazy, and unfit. This is Blaze's first impression. Well, it doesn't matter to him anyway. He didn't intend on catching pirates with them, he's going to spend the time here in training his hacky. His unit is responsible for roaming the East Blue and report to the base if they spot any pirate crew. Blaze left the crew management and ship navigation to Regis. He just wants to peacefully train without any distraction. Blaze then recollected the memories of events matching the current timeline, especially East Blue. If he's not wrong, Shanks will arrive at Fusha Village in 1511 but it should be around the year end and he will stay there for nearly one year. He knew hacky users become stronger when battling against stronger opponents. As a powerful hacky user, Shanks will be a good sparring partner. But the problem is, Blaze didn't know how strong Shanks is. He needs to be mindful of this before approaching him. He has more than eight months in his hands before Shanks arrives at the East Blue. It's up to Blaze to decide how much stronger he will become. If he works hard, he may stand a chance against the latter. Aside from Shanks, he remembers Kuna's death. When she died in the original series, it's one of the saddest moments. He won't let her die this time with him here. Kuna's death will happen at 1513, he still has time to prevent that from happening. Next, Blaze contemplated how to increase his strength faster. The simple way is by completing system tasks or by finishing some achievements. His task bar only had two tasks at the moment. Task, completely master house Hoku no Haki. Time limit, two years. Status, half awakened. Reward, 5.0 constitution plus 5.0 devil fruit potential plus 5.0 Haki points plus 5.0 free attribute points. Task 2, one punch man workout. Description, do 2000 push UPS, 2000 sit UPS, 2000 squats, and a 30 kilometers run daily for 750 days. Time, 750 days 520 slash 750. Reward, 5.0 constitution plus 5.0 devil fruit potential plus 3 free attribute points. In the second task, he already completed 520 days of training while another 230 days still remain. He has the confidence to complete the one punch man workout task in time. As for mastering house Hoku Haki, he just needs a month or two as he already grasped it to a certain extent. Eager to master his hacky skills, Blaze began his training without wasting any time while his marine ship departed from the Logetown port. Days flew by. Blaze worked hard when it came to training, from early morning to night. He would start the day by bathing in the morning sun, followed by the One Punch Man workout. After that, he would train in his armament and observation hacky for the rest of the day. Past evening, he would meditate and train his conqueror's hacky. His hard work and persistence didn't go to waste as his hacky kept on improving daily. After four months of continuous training, his armament hacky reached perfection. Now, he can perfectly coat his body with hacky. Not just his arms, he can do imbue any part of his body with hacky. Not only that, but he can also control the amount of hacky. As for his observation hacky, he trained them with the help of others in his unit. Especially, Regis, he helped him a lot with blindfolded practice. Occasionally, Blaze would stop on uninhabited islands and train with the wild animals. There are even times, he fought against the local sea kings and sea beasts. Observation hacky is primarily sensing one's intent or presence. Intent can only be felt when someone shows some kind of action or emotion while sensing presence is difficult. Presence or aura describes the person's nature, it also assists in ascertaining one's spiritual energy or strength. This ability allows anyone to see others, even if they are concealed from view or too far to see naturally. In Blaze's case, he can sense and feel others' heat. His observation hacky can cover a wide range, capture and distinguish others based on heat signature. As for the House Hoku Conqueror's hacky, he only mastered them after four months of training. He too didn't anticipate it would take this long, as he estimated he would master it in two months. But the real surprise came after he mastered his observation hacky when he suddenly sensed a different kind of energy in the surrounding during his meditation. This is natural energy. Blaze felt it. Is it because I have a Senju constitution? Natural energy is a form of energy that exists in the atmosphere, generated by the world itself. It's not just unique to Naruto world, it's just other worlds hadn't discovered or learned a way to utilize natural energy. As for Blaze, even if he wants to he doesn't know the way to utilize the natural energy. Just as he was feeling unfortunate, there was a change around him. 
Without him doing anything, the natural energy in the surrounding flew towards him and entered his body. They followed his breathing pattern and Blaze too noticed it. When he inhales, the natural energy flows into his body along with the air and leaves when he exhales. Not even a strand of it remained in his body after the process. It mystified Blaze. After analyzing a few times, he found the natural energy just flows in and out of his body and it didn't bring him any benefit. No, there should be something. Blaze knew very well about natural energy as it's a powerful energy source present in the world. After experimenting for another two days, he finally noticed a difference and it's a big one as even he couldn't believe his eyes. The change stems from his spiritual energy. Every time the natural energy flows in and out of his body, they influence his spiritual energy and enhances his constitution a little. It was minuscule when it comes to his constitution but it had a tremendous impact on his spiritual energy. It may also be the reason for his abnormal hacky reserve. The reason why he was able to sense the natural energy now, should be because of meditation. He had been meditating ever since he began to train in hacky. Of course, he can't absorb natural energy and generate Senjutsu Chakra since he has no idea how to do it. But, the surprise brought by natural energy is enough for him to be happy for days, because his hacky points raise by 0.1 every day when he meditates by absorbing natural energy. There was a huge change in his status panel after he mastered his house hoku hacky and completed the task. Task, completely master house hoku no hacky. Status, completed. Reward, 5.0 constitution plus 5.0 devil fruit potential plus 5.0 hacky points plus 5.0 free attribute points. The reward completely changed his attributes and elevated his combat strength to another level. A few months back his attributes were like this. Dash hacky, 15.3. Dash constitution, 41.2. Dash devil fruit potential, 36.4. Every week his constitution attribute increased by 0.2 points while his devil fruit potential attribute increased by 0.1. So, after 4 months, they were raised by 3.2 and 1.6 respectively. Combined with the reward, his constitution attribute grew from 41.2 to 49.4, just a little short of reaching 50 points while his devil fruit attribute increased from 36.4 to 43.0. As for his hacky, they rose by 0.5 every week in these 4 months due to his heavy training. They increased from 15.3 to 28.5, adding the reward. Blaze current status is as follows. Name, Blaze Hunt. Occupation, Marine. Constitution, 49.4. Devil fruit potential, 43.0. Hacky, 28.5. Free attribute point, 7.0. The effect brought by the natural energy is exceptional and a huge boost to him. It's just Blaze doesn't know for how many days this perk will work, as he knew this kind of thing won't be permanent. After some time, the effect natural energy had on his hacky will surely diminish. He needs to make complete use of it till it lasts. Suddenly, a notification sound buzzed in his mind startling him completely. Blaze checked and was surprised to see a new task. The system issued a new task after a long time. Task, save Don Quixote Rosinante and kill Fergo. Time, none. Reward, 1.0 constitution plus 1.0 devil fruit potential. Viewing the system task, Blaze was lost in thought and recalled everything he knows about Rosinante and Law. With his current strength, it won't be a problem for him to save Rosinante and kill Fergo. Hell, he's not even afraid of Doflamingo. But, it's a different story if had to face all the members of Don Quixote Pirates. He can only complete the mission covertly but before that, he has other things to worry about. Aside from the fact the event will occur at 1511, he doesn't know the exact month and date. Furthermore, he just can't simply leave the East Blue and visit the North Blue when he's on duty. If he does that, then Sengoku may get angry this time, for real. He needs a reason to visit the North Blue. Since System released the task, there may be a reason let's wait. Blaze doesn't know how he would do in a real fight. After all, he hadn't fought any hacky users after learning hacky. His body is itching for a fight. So, just the thought of facing Don Quixote pirates excited him. Another two months passed by. In these two months, the biggest improvement came from his spiritual energy as his hacky points rose gradually. They increased from 28.5 to 34.5. His constitution attribute stopped at 49.8, showing no signs of growth during the last two weeks. After pondering for days, Blaze decided to use the free attribute points and raise them to 50. Boom. As soon as he did that, his physique had a huge and visible change. His hair grew longer while his eyes had a golden tinge around them. He grew taller, standing around 6.7 feet in height. His shoulders widened a little, muscles enlarged with perfect proportions but there's no change in his lean frame. His build held explosive strength while the feeling of unprecedented power coursed through his body. Especially his vitality, his entire being brimmed with energy and life force. The rise in his physical strength enhanced his devil fruit potential and spiritual energy. Blaze thought in his head, how strong am I right now? Just as he was relishing the moment of power, Regis entered the cabin with a low knock on the door. But, he stood rooted on the spot noticing Blaze's change. How could a person change drastically in a single night? Regis was sure, Blaze looked normal last night. Blaze san what happened? Nothing, it was caused by a sudden increase in strength. Tell me, Blaze asked. Yes, snapping out of his thoughts and remembering his purpose, he quickly handed the Den Den Mushi to Blaze and said, Admiral Sengoku called, he wanted to have a word with you. Since you were busy in training, I didn't interrupt. Taking the Den Den Mushi, he dialed Sengoku's number. Purapura, 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 Kuka. Sengoku-san, Blaze here. Blaze brat, how's East Blue, is it to your liking? Sengoku spoke in a relaxed tone. I am bored as hell. I would be grateful if you send me to the New World, Sengoku-san. Blaze replied, sending you to New World is the same as instigating a war. 
Sai, it's too early for you to enter the new world and don't forget you are still under discipline. I, I, so, why did you contact me, Sengoku-san? Blaze asked. He has an idea why the latter called him. Is anyone near you? Blaze looked at Regis and the latter left the room without any noise understanding the cue. Blaze then replied. No, you can talk freely. I want you to do something. Sengoku then explained the deal regarding the Opop Nomi. I have intel that Don Quixote pirates will be there. I don't know how the trade got leaked. The truth is, I don't want to share about this mission if not for my bad premonition. Hearing this, Blaze's lips twitched. Am I that unreliable? Yes. So, what do you want me to do? Nothing? I want you to monitor the island in secret and wait for my orders. Make note, this an unofficial request personally from me. If someone finds your whereabouts, there's a chance you may be directly dismissed from the Marines. Do I have to partake in such a risky mission? You don't want to. Sengoku asked back, knowing full well about Blaze's personality. In fact, Blaze didn't want to do this for just two attribute points when he can gain them by simply training in one place. And, the real troublemaker is Rosinanti, godson of Sengoku. After thinking for a moment, Blaze decided to do it. Not for attribute points, but to save Rosinanti. He wanted to see how the future will develop, once he changes them. It's going to be entertaining, to mess with Dolphamingo, I will do it. Blaze replied while Sengoku updated him further about the details. The trade will happen two weeks from today. Reach the location a week before and monitor the situation, covertly. Okay, Minion Island. A week passed. As agreed by Sengoku, Blaze reached the island decked in ordinary civilian clothes. Everything below his eyes is covered by a light gray scarf, perfectly concealing his facial features. The entire Minion Island is overrun with pirates commanded by Diaz Barrels and was on constant lookout. He had to sneak his way in. Stepping on the island, Blaze's observation hacky covered the entire island and captured everyone's presence. He knew Rosinanti would steal the devil fruit three days prior to the appointed date. So, he had to wait for another three days before Rosinanti and Law arrives. The island had a snowy climate. It didn't take long for Blaze to find the ghost town where the Diaz Barrel's hideout is located. He stopped some distance away from them and called Sengoku. What is it? Have you reached the Minion Island? Sengoku attended the call and asked in a low voice. Yes, I am near their hideout. Do you want me to get the devil fruit? I don't think it will be a problem. Blaze expressed his thoughts and asked. What? Why did you go there? Did anyone spot you? Sengoku quickly asked. Relax, Sengoku-san. Heaving a sigh, Sengoku stated, this mission had to be discreet, so don't do anything foolish. Maintain some distance and wait. Inform me, if you find anything unusual. Okay. Four days passed. Blaze got bored, waiting. Finally, his hacky picked the presence of a figure rushing towards the mansion located at the top of the hill where Diaz Barrel is. It's Rosinanti? He then later creates an explosion around Diaz's place and blows up the mansion without making a sound. With his powers, Rosinanti sneaked in without making a sound and stole the OPI OPI Nomi without anyone noticing. He made fool of everyone with his devil fruit ability calm. Just as he rejoices getting the fruit, he accidentally slips on the snow and was circled by Diaz's men. Blaze saw everything but he didn't rush to help as he knew Khorasan will successfully escape. The explosion and fire caught the marine's attraction. Vice Admiral Tsuru complained and informed Sengoku. As for Sengoku, he thought it was caused by Blaze and soon called him. On the other hand, Blaze knew why Sengoku is calling him. As soon as he attended the call, a roaring voice came. Blaze, didn't I tell you to stay put? It's not me. Someone stole the OPI OPI no me from Diaz barrels and the commotion is caused by him. Blaze called responded. What? Who is it? Did you see his appearance? Yes, he had blonde hair. Blaze then described Rosinanti's features and his devil fruit ability calm. On the other side, Sengoku clenched his fist. Rosinanti, why? Don't tell me. He suddenly remembered the conversation he had with Rosinanti and the child who suffers from a condition known as Amber Lead Syndrome. Everything became clear to him. Rosinanti wants the child to eat the OPI OPI no me. Blaze, I know him. He's a marine undercover. Whatever happens, bring him back. Saying this, Sengoku ended the call. He didn't expect that Rosinanti who he considers his son would betray him. Though, he had a reason it doesn't wrong the right. On the other side, Rosinanti defeated the pirate minions and rushed towards Law's location. Blaze silently followed him. He didn't plan on seizing the Opop Nomi from the other party, as it will kill Law. He plans on intervening only after Fergo makes his appearance, catching him red hand will be fun. Rosinanti force fed the fruit to Law despite his protest. After that, Rosinanti collapses face first on the ground due to his injuries and assures Law that with the fruit he can cure himself. Under Rosinanti's persuasion, Law with an intelligence letter in his hand left the area to deliver it to the marines and ask for help. Blaze didn't go after Law and waited for him to come back as he knew he will. After around 15 minutes, Law came back carried by Fergo who was shocked by seeing Coruscant here. Rosinanti was also surprised and accidentally revealed his voice to Fergo. Everything happened as Blaze remembers. Fergo, being suspicious of Rosinanti's presence decides to check the intelligence letter given to him by Law despite Rosinanti's protest. After reading the letter, he delivers a vicious kick to Rosinanti's face. Law tries to stop Fergo, but the latter was unfazed and grabbed him in a choking grip. Throwing Law away, Fergo once again concentrated on Rosinanti. He was extremely angry as he knew if the Marine got the letter it would have ruined the years of planning made by the Doflamingo family. It's time to make my entry, Blaze thought and revealed his presence. Sensing his presence with observation hacky, Fergo looked towards his direction and shouted, Who? Clap, clap. Blaze came forward, clapping his hands. Gazing at Fergo, he asked with a smile. Fergo, long time no see, how are you doing? Blaze, what is he doing here? He saw everything. Fergo muttered to himself and attacked Blaze without any compassion as a former comrade. Is this how you greet me, meeting after a long time? 
Blaze asked again effortlessly evading Fergo's hacky powered strike. Before Fergo could attack again, a powerful blow came to his stomach. He blocked with his hands the attack but Blaze's kick broke his hacky defense and throw him back. The unforeseen development stunned both Rosinante and La, especially Rosinante, he didn't expect the all-powerful Fergo would be taken by a single blow. Taking advantage of the situation, Rosinante grabbed La and tried to flee the area. But Blaze's next word stopped him. Don't bother. You can't run away from me. Furthermore, I was sent by Sengoku-san to bring you back. Now, create a noise field around the area. I don't want my fight to draw others' attention. Hearing the last part, Rosinante was shocked. How did he know about my devil fruit ability? Did Sengoku-san told him? Still, he did as Blaze asked since the latter is on his side. At that moment, Fergo recovered from the strike and got back to his feet. Blaze's strength completely caught him off guard and shocked him. The last strike is the best proof, his hacky was completely overwhelmed by the other party. Fergo knew he isn't the latter's match. You have become stronger. Fergo commented. Unlike me, you were always strong but hiding it. Only today I found the reason for it. Blaze lied without any change in expression. 